Salutations, everyone. It is Maddie here today with week 92 of the Ham Radio Podcast. And this is Carrick with ACG. Uh, second time I've been on here. Yeah. Hello, man. I love it. I love it. Thank you. And today we have our first patron guest joining us. Would you kindly introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hello, everybody. I'm Nick Nocturne of the channel Nightmind on YouTube. First time uh, joining this podcast. I do have a sort of <laughs> podcast of my own over on my channel. Much more uh, based on horror and uh, dark media and that sort of field over there. But uh, I've been a longtime fan of Mr. Matty Plays and the Ham Radio podcast, <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here. Cool, cool. Welcome aboard, Excellent. man. Today... We're going to be discussing Bioware, and for the record, if you guys want to get involved with the podcast like Nick is here, uh, you can become a patron and you'll enter to be, uh, have a chance to join as one of the hosts for a week. So we're trying to bring on as many of you guys as possible. This is a much more organized fashion. This was so fucking easy compared to how we've done it in the past, Nick. I got to tell you what, uh, usually, like I said, we grab them off of Twitter. It's just so haphazard. But anyway, like I said, we're talking about Bioware today, and we're looking at Mass Effect Andromeda. The release is fastly approaching us and i think what we should do to lead into this conversation is talk about our perspective on bioware in general carrick would you like to lead off what you think about bioware old versus new yeah uh i mean old bioware obviously is something that i grew up with so the, their very first games even mdk those kind of games so i'm super excited to see if they can go and capture that but I certainly, and, and you and I have talked about this, I certainly feel like some of their older stuff, especially when you create a company and you have those doctors in charge and, and you have leadership of a particular kind, when they left, I do feel that unfortunately we saw a little bit of that spirit leave. And, that, and that's okay, right? That's okay with any company. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to see what they do. But I have to say, I'm more of a fan of their past stuff, past, past, like yourself, like the KOTORs um, and even, even prior to that. Versus uh, Mass Effect 1, definitely, but, you know, that's when things started to... Mm -hmm. I, I didn't look forward to them as much, I guess, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I would say you know? I'm in the same boat as you. Definitely a fan of the older Bioware. I think I'd say around Dragon Age 2 is when I started to lose confidence in uh, them. Uh, and right. then, moving on from there, I, I wasn't a huge fan of a lot of their works. Nick, on the other hand, you have a very yeah. unique perspective compared to us. Would you kindly <laughs> go ahead and explain that one? I do. I have the perspective of somebody walking in here who has not finished a Bioware game. <laughs> but I have been around for all of the talk about Mass Effect throughout the years. Um, particularly, I kept up with the news back when Mass Effect 3 came out and there was the huge, huge controversy about its ending and the and the backlash that came from the fans regarding that. Mm -hmm. And um, just, I'd never witnessed that with a company who, who made something that had massive fan reaction to a bad call and specifically a bad ending to a major franchise and mass effect is a game that's been lauded throughout the years i did play a bit of the first one and i know the storyline of it but like i said i've never played a full game now coming into it at this stage seeing andromeda initiative and knowing that the storyline that's going to continue from here is brand new i'm seeing a lot of things i like hmm. um especially versus what I was seeing before with the previous Mass Effect storyline. One of the things that really, really appeals to me, just looking at this for the first time, is that with the previous Mass Effect storyline, it was all about a galaxy that was sort of well-known from, from the perspective that I've got seeing the story played out. Whereas Andromeda, it's a brand new field. So the story is literally, you're, take, you're going on a ship with a bunch of allies from these other species... Heading off to a new galaxy just to see what's there, to see if it's habitable. And that's fascinating to me. That is that is cool when you put it that way. I absolutely agree with that. And it's a good way, I think, to introduce newcomers to the Mass Effect franchise without losing that Mass Effect feel, which is very key. It's not just a, a strict reboot. It's actually, in a way, tied into the original trilogy as uh, I think they, they leave... For the Andromeda Galaxy between Mass Effect 2 and 3, and then they wake up 600 years later. Um, so, yeah, I, I can say I agree with... I like the way they're taking the story, but I also feel like, based off what I've seen, they're focusing more on the action aspect than the RPG aspect, which is where our opinions differ. Because for me, I look at old Bioware, I think I loved the choices I can make in KOTOR, the choices I can make in Dragon Age Origins, and then I look at mass effect andromeda and i'm thinking i'm seeing the choices more deviate to the gameplay 
compared to what I mean, mind you, we don't really know much about story decisions yet, but I'm just saying I've seen a gameplay decision focus for Bioware in previous titles. I don't see why it would change with Andromeda, especially with the new leveling system. It makes me feel like they're continuing that course of, um, you know, freedom in the gameplay and the story is, is taking more of a backseat. Yeah, Taking a look I, at some of oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, you you, you can go ahead. No, go ahead, Nick. Oh, um, all right. Yeah, uh, earlier I was looking over some of the gameplay footage, and so, something that um was brought up, and I believe you brought it up as well, Maddie, before when talking about Fallout Four, is that there's definitely been a shift in recent years for RPGs, less less of a focus on making decisions and storylines, more towards shooting in action. And Fallout 4 definitely had a touch of that that I'm I am seeing repeated here a little bit in some of the gameplay footage in the trailers that are coming out for Andromeda. Mm-hmm. Because we're not seeing so much of the dialogue wheels and the choices that can be made in the interactions with characters. I'm seeing a lot of flying around the screen and shooting things and throwing grenades and ducking gunfire. And uh the, your video recently about the skill point system did highlight that there's a little bit less of choosing who your character is going to be and experiencing that throughout the story now whereas you're just kind of progressing and getting buffs with your points as you shoot things down Mm -hmm. and now some people made a good point is that they're like well maddie are they really going to show you tucked in cover you making story decisions what compels you to uh watch a trailer and get excited for a game when you see that but i mean i think of launch trailers for games they usually have the most juicy story details and they come out a day before or two days before a game launches and when i see those and you get uh, a general idea of where the plot's heading and how intense things can get for example that excites me i'm not saying my excitement share is uh shared with everyone but for me that's what i think of is that you can still show that cool action i think actually a, a good example would be um Honestly, maybe even Fallout 4's launch trailer. You know, it gave you some hints on the storyline, but it also showed the typical action. Now, mind you, that this game, in a lot of ways, reminds me of Fallout 4 in not the best way. So that's why I'm a little bit afraid for Mass Effect Andromeda. But still, I I, I get where where people are coming from. That, yeah, they want to sell that this game looks fucking cool and that so that people can go, wow, I want to play this. Because that's what you do. You play a game. Um, You can watch a movie and learn a story wherever you want. But I think the most important part of a game is blending all those elements together into something that says, like, this is a video game in the sense of a storytelling medium, gameplay, sound, and just all works together. I, I think it's also important to understand, though, and it might be something you're, mem- you're remembering, Maddie. It, those trailers for Mass Effect 1, Jade Empire, they did have story elements in their first mm-hmm. trailers. Yes. And we're not seeing that here. And uh, when you look at a situation where, like, let's say, they're old grognards back in the day when these two doctors made Bioware Dungeon and Dragons was big. Dungeon and Dragons used to be a miniatures board game before it or a miniatures game before it turned into like a role-playing title these guys had crunchy backgrounds mm-hmm. um they're very crunchy very numbered crunchy very rpg style backgrounds and then as they go away and they're replaced by people who have grown up r- remembering that people like myself and yourself our age are now developing these what do they have as their experiences that they want to put in a game well they have games that are a little bit um softer and so we saw that even with Mass Effect 1 to 2, the huge difference between how the game was 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 done between 1 and 2. And so, I mean, I get it. Uh, it it's unfortunate, not, but I think that maybe, unfortunately, you and I uh, may be in that situation where we're like the old people saying, get off our, our lawn and, <laughs> you know, get off our RPG lawn, yeah. get, leave, our, leave our dice here. And that's what sort of scares me because every every group that I belong to, genres that I like, there's always that one person that you talk to who remembers the day when things were a little different. And I've never wanted to be that person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, nah, it, I know. It, I agree. It feels like you and I might be going, hmm, remember when Mass Effect was this? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree that I don't want to be that guy. I want to be able to move with the times. Oh, it's fine. Think, you know, change happens, but it's just like, is this good change? That's the question right. I'm left with, really. Yeah substantial good changes is the question i think mm-hmm. yeah so I, here, here's what i can tell you guys based on on that conversation you described it uh Garrick, as not wanting to be seen as the guy saying leave our dice on the lawn <laughs> but um i i can tell you that coming into this see seeing how it's been i i remember the term and some people hate this term but i i know it kind of applies to the situation here casualized um i'm i'm i kind of agree with you on this 
when I go into a game like this, I want those RPG elements. I don't want to be able to have what, what Matty described in his previous video as one of the symptoms that comes with being able to score points and build up those points and get all the buffs is at the end of the game, you're a god. You can do everything. Everything is within your power. And you can make that decision to learn a new skill just based on the flip of a coin and the press of a button. Yeah. And that is that is a little bit too easy. That's a bit too shootery. Mm-hmm. Like, like just running through and picking up power-ups, but in a new setting... So when it comes to leaving the dice on leaving the dice on the lawn, I I agree. Let's let's take the dice back. Let, let's make it a case where it is a bit more RPG. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just you see, I I look at Mass Effect Andromeda and how I I just don't see. First off, my issue it starts with less of being a god and more so that that issue is applied because for some reason nowadays game developers think that they want everyone to see everything in one playthrough i don't know if it's a lack of trust with the gamer to start up a new playthrough and see things on the other side if they'll get halfway through and go oh i've already kind of seen this screw this switching games i don't know if there's a statistic i'm missing that shows that gamers stay locked into one character longer than uh starting a new playthrough and maybe doing like an evil guy playthrough for example i don't know if that's True or not, but I, I don't know why the perspective isn't focused on let's show them all they can do in one playthrough or not. Let's show them what happens when they make different decisions and they can do different playthroughs. I mean, a lot of people are watching Mass Effect trailers. A lot of people are hyped for this game. Why not make a branching story path trailer and just show one small minuscule example on how your decision can branch off and have impacts around like a hub world or something. I mean, this game boasts that you can drop off on whatever planet you want. Uh, check it out and they they showed that in the gameplay trailer i think it was for the game awards how you just land on this outpost and you get involved with this gang hideout and stuff it would be cool just to build on that example and show what happens if you um after you disarm the turian guard i think it was what happens from there and what happens if i don't disarm them what happens if i open fire you know just keep branching out on that because i think that could sell an aspect of the game to maybe the gamer who like you said i don't like the term either nick but uh maybe likes things a little more casualized and go, oh, I'm getting into something a little bit different here, but I like what I see. I know that this is, you know, something I can handle. Because I know, you know, we play video games a lot where, for example, um, someone who doesn't play RPGs a lot needs a lower entry barrier. And I'm not saying that in, like, the dumb way, like, they can't handle it. But, um, you know, I look at games like, what's a strategy? Like, Halo Wars 2 I recently played. That's a game where the Blitz mode is a lower entry barrier, where if you don't like strategy games... With the Blitz mode, because it's just cards, it's a little more simplistic, but still has that hardcore strategy element. I could see a lot of people being like, Halo Wars 2 was the game that got me into strategy. So I get why they lower the entry barrier a little bit. They focus on the gameplay, don't show as much story, don't have as many intimidating choices. But I think if you show them that first, then introduce that, hey, we also have these hardcore elements, you can make both sets of fans happy. I mean, I just don't see why cut off one aspect for the other. It just it makes me feel so lost. It's weird because I was talking to, and you know who it is, Maddie. We can't say it uh, on the air, but there's an insider who who knows a lot about this. And I I was like, all I want to do is I want to drive around in my car on an unknown planet with my feet up, drinking a beer at full speed and smashing into shit. Can I do that? And then can I also do a bunch of RPG stuff? And what I was told was yes, and that the developers are distinctly aiming for an ME1, but cultivated and a little bit slicker but not an ME2 or an ME3 in their overall gameplay, as in they were looking for role-playing. But the thing is, is nothing I have seen has shown that. Yeah. Exactly what you said. And so I am super excited because if what that insider who does know, by the way, we know for a fact that they they definitely know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, I I would say they're at 100% right now. Um, I, I would love for all that to be true because I asked exactly what you and I have talked about. It's like, can I go to this planet? Can I do this? Can I role play this? And and the most important thing to me is that at the end of a game, you and I go, dude, I had a different experience than you did. Yeah. And then I want to engage in your experience, and now you want to engage in mine, so we play again. And mm-hmm. 
it, it, gamers have become so scared of the gray area in gaming. It's either Dark Souls or it's fucking you know, uh, garden warfare, you know, plants versus zombies. <laughs> it's there, there's no gray area. And I want a gray area because gray areas are inherently scary to a gamer. And one of the reasons why is because it's money. That is a risk, mm -hmm. you know, 60 bucks. I got to pay, but man, I want that. I like going into those games and going, okay, what am I, you know, like if I, if I talk to Maddie on Twitter, he may not do, he may not have done or seen what I did. But unfortunately, when I talked to developers, they did tell me what you said. You, you were talking about stats. You said, is there a hidden stat? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, there are. Okay, and there one you of, go. That's, one, that's what I want to hear then. Yeah, one of them was scary as hell. And it was that a recent RPG company who hasn't released an RPG yet was doing a little bit of play testing. And they had some locked out careers, classes, right? You could only do these classes if you had specific stats. They got back. Every single play tester was the only thing they focused on. The only thing they focused on was that. That was the only th they they could not leave it alone. Every question, everything regarded why can't I do everything right away? And so the company had to have their CEO, had to have their lead developer all sit there and go, do we roll this back a couple months? Because this will take a, a great deal of time. We never assumed people would have this issue. Or do we roll forward and maybe explain it in PR and stuff. They decided to roll forward, so choice, which is huh? good. Yeah, um, but it's good in in this in the face of man. If I was a developer, I'd be scared shitless if every person who played my game had an issue with one friggin'. I mean, you know, even if I believed in it, I'd still that that set you back. Yeah, and make you absolutely. Go, oh shit, you know, should mm -hmm. we look at this again or so? That is a crazy situation to think about. Spending all that time doing something that you might know is a little bit bold and a little bit risky. But you think it's going to work and then everybody comes back and they say the same thing. And it's precisely yeah. what you were afraid of. Change, change is tough. It's tough to introduce a new element to something that you've been doing. Especially when everybody else around you has been doing the same thing for so long. And it seems to be working. But you want to do something that feels a little bit like you have slightly more integrity. And getting a bit back to basics. But man, that kind of pushback is... That's really tough. Yeah. Yeah. And imagine, I mean, imagine what they must feel like if they're sitting there going, okay, do we go Dark Souls? We make it super difficult. Or do we go generalized and, and make it super easy? And instead, uh, yeah, nobody wants to do a gray area. I mean, even the developers we talk to all the time are saying stuff like, well, you know, we have to make sure that uh, the person with the casual cash can buy, buy this and play it. Oh, well, we have to make sure this person who saved up their money has to play it. Those two people enter a game in a different way. Financial status. And, and how you go about purchasing a game is actually incredibly important mm -hmm. because it, do, you, do you purchase it casually? Is 60 bucks casual to you? Well, then you might expect different things. And it, right now, there's a danger zone because there's a lot of games out there also battling for that money. And so it's like everybody's trying to figure out how to maximize their cash, which is actually one of the developers told us is definitely the reason they do microtransactions. So they, don't, they can take a chance. So what I was told was, we're going to do microtransactions in this upcoming game. We've never had microtransactions before. The reason why we're doing it is so that we can take chances in the base game mm. and, and not worry about as, as many front-end sales. I never thought about that as a reason for microtransactions. But yeah. that's... I'm not sure about... Hmm. That really does make you think. It's like, are they as evil as we thought? It feels like a big revelation in a plot right now. It's like, oh, yeah. fuck. They're not the bad guy anymore. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I bet you they are, you know, mm -hmm. but I bet you they're not. I mean, I, they're, I mean, these guys, I know for a fact, everybody likes them. So it'll be interesting to see how it rolls out. But you have some reviewers, some gamers. I don't know if Nick feels this. I know Maddie and I have talked about it. Some people believe that if it has a microtransaction at all, it's instantly a game that's bad, right? Like you see that all the time. Yeah. And, uh, and I get that. I, yep, I mean, I, yep. get, I get the thought process of it. But talking to developers and having messed around with some of that stuff on my own and worked in test, I can tell you that that's... Developers are people too, so they have complexities there. You yeah. know, you know, there's complexity everywhere, and I think everybody's scared of complexity right now. It's a scary sort of a scary time for the industry, anyway. Mm -hmm. For me, it, it, the microtransactions, as long as it doesn't impact the game experience, like if it's a player versus player experience, like I, I don't mean to go back to Halo Wars two again, but that's just the most recent and current example I can bring up. And a good one, yeah, is that uh, there are microtransactions. You can buy card packs for the Blitz mode. This guy used a fucking scarab on me destroyed my whole team with it because he had a really good card yeah I, it didn't matter that i had a good setup or anything and that my team is making a comeback he called in a really powerful card and destroyed us that guy could have just dropped 20 bucks and got that meanwhile i have to grind my way to it we don't know how frequently you get these awesome cards 
So that's where my issue with microtransactions lies is that. Where if it's yeah. a Overwatch, um, I don't, I can't think right now. Of if other it's a pair games. of pants. Yeah, yeah. If it's like a, a game where it's just cosmetics. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, Overwatch does it in a really smart way where they are milking it dry. I mean, they got a new event coming up, the Chinese New Year. And I mean, the skins look amazing. You can't help it because they just nailed the character personality right where you want to buy those skins <laughs> want to get right. them as fast as possible i mean they were they were smart enough to add an arcade mode to let you get loot boxes a little bit quicker but getting off track point being is that if it's cosmetics that's not really a big deal because i think that falls on the player to decide do i really really need this compared to a player versus player experience where it's like well i really have to drop cash to win this do i want to continue playing this game that's where my issue with microtransactions lies but with the way you put it i can understand that where if you were going to take a chance with a game and put cosmetic microtransactions to ensure that you could take more risks up front. Now that you have that perspective there, yeah, I would be okay with that personally. And I'm not a I fan think, of microtransactions. I know you're not, but I think unfortunately what that does is falls into the uh, uh, one more. Uh, you you know, I've talked about like the, the danger zones of guessing too much. And I think that does put a gamer in a, a weird position of guessing why somebody did something mm -hmm. so you know i know because i talked to them true and yeah. i talked to people who not are very nefarious did. but not everybody did and and you and i've talked about this with reviewing it's like well when i review this game should i go and investigate every developer who worked for them should seven developers making a game be worth more than 20 yeah. like so you don't want to know too yeah, much the game's a game you know mm. yeah game's a game exactly yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult man mm. okay any thoughts on microtransactions yeah, I've always, <laughs> I'm definitely of the school of thought that a lot of games have been moving to microtransactions, especially for things that they really shouldn't be charging for. Yeah. And it's boiled down to it for me that if it feels that it's something that should have come with the base game built in, then don't you pay, pay a damn cent for it. They shouldn't be charging for it. If it's cosmetic stuff and it's extras, if it's an additional add-on to the product, then yes, sure. Have a price tag on it. But if it's something that it feels like, uh, oh, yeah, you know, this this was something we planned from the beginning, but we realized we could charge you for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, no, don't you dare. Don't you dare pay them for that. That's mm -hmm. that's just scummy. Yeah. It reminds I understand me of, the need for them. But reminds me of a, a lot of season passes. Uh, Arkham Knight, for example, where they sold a $50 season pass and said, we're just going to have a couple of missions and races in it. We're not sure quite what yet. It's like bullshit. You don't know bullshit you know yeah. I, I don't like that at all when when developers try to sell like they don't actually fallout 4 did that they were like yeah we have a season pass we don't know what we're gonna do yet and they make far harbor which was fucking gigantic it's like yeah you made this in like what five months come on like, give me a break mm. uh, yeah it's like i i wonder how stupid game developers and publishers think the consumer is and and maybe they just look at the numbers and say well they're buying it they can't know much better well and that's the problem is we're all here and people who are listening are I, we discussed this last last radio is that uh, we're I mean, not more intelligent because we're better or anything, but yeah. we have the Internet. We do those things. Yeah, a we're, lot of we're people who are buying these extra games level of discussion. Ex exactly. And that extra discussion allows us to question some of this. And a person, for example, um, I, I belong to a 700 person land group. And in that land group, I would say six. No game uh, news. Six. Tops. No, mm. maybe less, maybe five. The rest buy games because of a commercial or they go to a website and they a game is releasing. They have no care about any of the stuff we're talking about Com versus us three and the people who watch. They even my little land group outnumbers us and they're mm. casual technically if you if you would consider. But they're not. They own land computers. They own some of the you know best computers in the world. It's just, it's odd, man. And, and there's so many gray areas. I think it's really difficult. And when you look at like Mass Effect, for example, if you get Andromeda, which we know the multiplayer, I don't know if you read this, but the multiplayer and the single player are connected much more. Again? Uh, almost, like yeah, three? they're almost intrinsically in this. Yeah, more so. Wow. More so, they said that they said you will not have to, to leave the single player to play the multiplayer. You will not have to leave the single player, which probably means it's a strike force of some kind out of your ship. And um, if that's true... Um, did you see Dragon Age Inquisition's m mini transactions? I, yeah, did. And I hated oh, Dragon uh, Age Inquisition. I didn't like Dragon Age Inquisition's multiplayer at all. It was so. So bad. that's what I'm worried. This will be mm -hmm. exact. Is actually what I was com what I was coming to. I'm. I, I agree. I was not a fan, and I'm actually very worried that that's sort of what we'll see here. Because it's pick a class. You can't. You're not open. 
You pick a class, you jump in. See, it shocks me, though, because I've said this time and time again. Mass Effect 3's multiplayer is, like, the most underrated shit ever. That was so good. I played that. Yeah. I, I can't even put a number on it. I played that for so many hours. I absolutely adored that multiplayer experience. Just the, the horde with friends, but in the Mass Effect franchise. It, just something about it. I can't even really determine what was just very enjoyable. I think it was the mixture of my powers and feeding off my friend's powers where I'd sit back as an infiltrator. One would move up as a vanguard. You'd have those epic moments where it'd be like a 1v20 survival match. Um, yeah, I've always been a fan of horde modes thanks to Gears of War. But um, just something about Mass Effect 3's multiplayer I, I really enjoyed. And I was hoping Inquisition would continue that. Didn't at all. It was just bad. Just just a bad multiplayer mode. And um, that's what shocks me too about the, that game getting Game of the Year is that you could argue uh, whether or not you enjoyed the single player experience based off what kind of Bioware fan you are, I think, and, and what kind of games you like. But the multiplayer, I mean, it's like no one even considered that a component of the game because it was so bad. There has not been a, a person I think I've seen who's outright defended the multiplayer or, or mentioned it in the game of the year discussion. Like, this is why we picked it. Like, it's, it's everyone pretended this component to the game just didn't exist. Right. It blows my mind. It really does. Yeah, uh, what I was wanting to know is, have either one of you guys? So we know we know sort of the setup of what uh, Mass Effect uh, Andromeda is going to be and all that stuff. And I'm I'm super excited. I want to make sure people understand. I really am. It's just I'm a little nervous, but mm -hmm. I, I cannot wait to see it. But w are you guys happy with the idea of it being merged in? Because it's it they they're calling it a strike force. So I'm assuming it means you're engaged in your ship, which which is called what? Can somebody remind the me what the ship's Tempest. name is? Tempest. The Tempest. Okay, so you're inside the Tempest. My assumption is you then go to a room and that's your multiplayer room and it's a lobby, you know, hidden on your ship. Um, mm. Do you guys like that or do you like a separated multiplayer? I think that's actually a pretty cool idea. Uh, something I've noticed about what they're doing with this campaign is that they're trying to get really immersive. They're trying to bring the world to the player before the player even gets their hands on the disc, which is incredible. Um, yeah, with the I, I come from a realm yeah, on right. yeah the initiative. I come from a realm on YouTube of alternate rally games and immersive web series. So I'm all about that. And whenever I find somebody doing that for my company, I really love getting my hands on that and exploring what they've made. So when when it comes to what what you just brought up, I think that's a really cool idea of taking your character in the ship and you access a port a port on the ship. That's kind of set up like reaching communications with somebody else, and there's yeah. your multiplayer. You don't even have to bring yourself to the meta level of this is the menu in the game for multiplayer. It's more you're accessing the command port on the ship to reach the others, and then you get into a conflict. I like that. I do, too. Yeah, I agree. I, I like the... Um, as long as it's not, like, I don't want to say forced, but it's not, like, in your face, I guess, which I, I'd imagine it's not if it's just a, a little starboard on a ship or whatever where it acts as in the multiplayer um i think that's fine and i, I like it that way because like you said nick it um definitely brings in a different type of immersion where it's not like yeah this is the menu now you're exiting you're going to the main menu like in mass effect 3 multiplayer option then you're in the multiplayer um that's one cool thing that i think this generation has brought is that seamless integration of multiple components within a game all in one rather than uh splitting it up between menus and loads load times and stuff yeah, and I'm not an immersion freak, mind you. So uh, uh, that says a lot, I think. I, I just can't wait because, like, um, uh, some of my best memories of I would say my gaming life, even though I started on a 2600, is uh, is Mass Effect One, mm -hmm. and and going to these po dunk planets that they were like, you can go to a planet and you can explore and you'd land and there'd be like six things. <laughs> Congratulations, goodbye, and you'd be like, ah, oh, that's not really a planet. And from what I was no, told, no, sir, that was no man's sky you just described. <laughs> exactly. And and actually, that was one billion things to do on a planet that was far too large and none of them were fun. And so you, you look at this situation where, like, you're it, it, from what I've been told, they are aiming for a Mass Effect one, but make them like the hinterlands. Now, here's what scares me, because the moment I mentioned the hinterlands from Dragon Age Inquisition, it, it brings up the fact that I've told Maddie this a couple times, actually, that. Prior to Inquisition, well, as Inquisition was being made, we know that Bioware hired three MMO developers, and we saw that in Inquisition's design. Mm -hmm. With Hinter, Hinterlands, the big meme is, you know, please leave the Hinterlands because it's just, it's, it's 
kept fetch mission after fetch mission after fetch mission. Yeah, and mission. people are like, oh, I spent 30 hours there. I'm like, was any of it fun? <laughs> exactly. So I asked and I was like, I do not want this. And I was told no, that those people who had that experience, one or two are still working, maybe even maybe just one on this game and others are working on other games. I and that they those games. <laughs> they <laughs> that they know and that they are going away from that. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if they go away from the hinterland style of Go grab 10 furs, go grab, well, MMO. I mean, that's an MMO. Yeah. If you go, if you can get away from that and you can go more towards, you know, something that's a little bit more symbolic of a, of a true game that we expect, like an RPG like that, man, I can't wait. Like mm -hmm. I'm so, I, there's, there's no other game series out there that I want to succeed than Mass Effect. I just, I, everything about it, Star Trek, Flash Gordon crap just excites the hell out of me. Yeah. Um, but man. They just, they don't have the best track record. Yeah, at least lately. They have a very good history, but lately, you know, between uh, Inquisition, Dragon Age 2, Mass Effect 3's ending. I mean, the, the thing here, though, we, we have to realize is that there is really one big blunder on the Mass Effect name. That would be, namely, the ending. From what From what memory serves me right now, I can only draw up. Meanwhile, most of these flaws sit with the Dragon Age franchise. I think so, yeah. It could be possible that this is like a Bethesda Game Studio situation where you see this deep level of care with the Elder Scrolls license, but then you look at Fallout and you see them experimenting with it, just not making like the right decisions, um, oh, where it's right. not turning out as well as that other franchise that they look like they give immense amount more fucks about. That could be possible. Um, not that they care more, but just that... Maybe they have a better grip on, like, this is what makes Mass Effect special versus this is what made Dragon Age special. Because as far uh, as I'm yeah. concerned, I look at Dragon Age Origins. You had a working formula right there. People fucking adored that game. Why did you oh, change yeah. it so drastically, too, and then even more with Inquisition? I, um, you know, it, it seems like with Mass Effect, at least I look at it. I look at one, I'm like, okay, there's a, a real focus on narrative here, on choices you make, you know, action combat, though. Uh, but more so on how you build your character. Two, I think was, in my personal opinion, uh, that was my favorite one. I know a lot of people either, either pick one or two. Uh, for me, it's two, though. I just like how they, they emphasize the action a little bit more, but it didn't come at the sacrifice of the decisions you made. A uh, good example to refer to is always that suicide mission right at the end of two. Um, and then three, uh, you saw the, the progression of action focus even more. Um, where you'd be able to like yank people over cover and stab them with your Omni tool or whatever it's called. Um, you know, the Vanguard class, I think that's when it was first introduced in Mass Effect 3, where you know, you're know you darting around, turning into a fucking human missile and hitting people. Um, stuff like that, where it became a little more in your face, and um, then it completely forgot all the choices that mattered at the end. So I guess with that progression, that's why there uh, lies a bit of concern with Andromeda as well. But I think we should talk a little bit about what is exciting us with this title. On the other hand of thing, or the side of things, rather. Uh, I, I will say, I think the narrative is because they've switched it from Renegade. So I liked Renegade Paragon, but they switched it to four. And they are head, as in thought, casual, heart, and professional. And so you have four instead of the typical three. And they're going to be separated a little bit uh, differently, which I actually like that. I, li I like that idea. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm a huge narrative fan, yeah. like a massive narrative fan. <laughs> so to me, that is the best news out of, out of all of it is some news about the narrative. What about you, Nick? What are you liking so far? Oh, I agree. Narrative. When, when it comes to games for me, I'm all about the story. I'm about story and exploration. If you've got a world that I can explore and a lot of story in it, then I'm right there. And that's, that's what they're offering right now is, I mean, they're, they're literally promising you. A story where you go to a place that's never been explored. You've got no right. idea what's out there. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that is really exciting to me. And you even start as somebody that's basically brand new slate. With Mass Effect, yeah. you come in as Commander Shepard. Sure, you build your own version of what Commander Shepard is, but, he's, but he or she is still Commander Shepard. They've got a history. They're trained. Somebody like um, a Pathfinder, they're a clean slate. They've had their training, they've been selected for the program, and then they just go they're dropped into the situation and you get to build them from the ground up and experience this entire journey with them in a brand new place it feels it feels a lot like some of the uh the setups from fallout as a vault dweller who goes mm -hmm. out into the world yeah you got a label but not that. A... well they call you rider 
I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I guess it, it works in the sense that the Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 had Shepard, so yeah, you're probably naturally going to call yourself something. Um, I would have rather them just call you the Pathfinder or something like that and stick with that. You know, you know, if you want to voice my protagonist like the other ones, go ahead. But uh, I don't know, just the, the Rider thing kind of, I guess, with how I like my RPGs still threw me off a little bit because I can see why, you know, Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 were established. You are Commander Shepard. Like you said, clean slate, Pathfinder with Mass Effect Andromeda. They didn't have to do the, you know, this is Ryder. You know what I'm saying? So, mm, but right, um, in, the, in the terms of what I'm excited for, though, yeah, I agree. Narrative is something I always look forward to in a Bioware game. But if I'm honest, I'm excited for exploration because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I look at a lot of games and I just feel like... Um, not many of them get it right where, you know, you see something in the distance and you're like, what is that? And I think if they give you a lot of planets to explore and each one offers a little something worth of uh, Morrowind. substance. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's, Morrowind yeah. nailed it. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. Where you just really any uh, Bethesda game studios game. Um, the yeah. Witcher three did it very well. Uh, just that sense of exploration. You see something, you see someone, what happened here and investigating um, and finding out what went down. If they can do that with Mass Effect Andromeda on these uh, anonymous planets and they just, you know, turn out to be something where each one's an individual experience, where each one has their own quest, I don't think that's too much to ask for. Uh, I think I'm set up for an uh, experience I will love. Um, I'm not against the action focused on the combat. Um, I do like the more tactical focus, though, in the earlier Mass Effect games where you'd tell your uh, companions where to go and you're not doing what they showed in the Andromeda gameplay, which is, like, literally flying around like fucking Django Fett. Like, uh, but, you know, I, I just don't want that to take away from the narrative. So if the narrative's good, I, I will be very happy because then I know I will have a gameplay system I'm going to enjoy at the very minimum and I'm going to have a narrative that will satisfy me. And that will make Mass Effect Andromeda a very good game. Because I'm not even concerned about like the music aspect. Uh, Bioware is very good with sound, in my opinion. Uh, between voice performances and picking the right tracks or just sometimes shutting the music off in general. It just it, it always, I felt, they had a very good grip on how to set the, the moment for whatever is going yeah. on. I'm right, with, I'm right there with you on the exploration front. Um, you actually just reminded me, one of the coolest things I saw from the trailer... Um, as a writer, you're going around and you've got this sort of device that's analyzing everything in front of you. It picks up footsteps. It takes a look at the body and it gives you a scan of the body. And it feels so much like detective mode from the Arkham Knight series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. That, that is, I, I actually love that. Mm -hmm. If they're if they going to give us the ability to go into a place that we've never seen before and just explore and do a lot of detective work and find out the story and piece things together, that I'm all for that. That is very cool. What I'm worried uh, about, though, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Carrick, just uh, the thought hit me. Absolutely, go is for that, it. Um, and this is with any game, mind you, not just Bioware, but I like when they show the gameplay components um, in these trailers. I get worried that they set up, like, a, a, pl a pl bullet point list of, like, all these different types of mission structures they can give us, and then each planet has that same mixed bag set where, you know, okay, we got uh, get three of this, kill X of that, right. Uh, investigate this murder mystery, help out this gang hideout, capture this base, and then you know, you'll go to planet one, you'll have capture this, kill that, and then planet two will have instead capture this, kill that, and... We have a settlement know, that needs our help. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where It's just like, uh, oh, we have varied game planets, but it's like, do you know, really do you? Because you're really just randomizing that checklist. Uh, Am I killing, rescuing, or harvesting this time? Yeah, exactly. So it, you know, it's that same list and uh I, I just hope they don't take it that way where um what happens there is for me like i said i'm not a big immersion guy but that's something that will break my immersion where i'll be really into things and i'll notice that like okay this planet's structured the same way is this really a unique individual well thought out planet or was this just a okay let's see what kind of missions we have here okay put those there and it, it feels like it's just a copy and paste template um and i i don't like that personally because that was my issue with inquisition each area you explored did not feel special because they didn't really offer missions or quests and had its own unique problems um, that felt different from any other area I went to. It's like, really, there's another fucking dragon here? Really, you need five of this? Okay. Well, 
and I agree. I think the problem with um, w- with a lot of games is pe- so so you know you have different developers who have written entire books on the 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 onion style of game development, layer by layer. The, one of the problems there with like go. let's that's, say that's a term it, I was looking for. Yeah. So let's say there's a dragons a, dragon age. One of the issues there is that everything felt like an outer layer. And then, and they all had the same, no matter where you were, it felt more like a globe. It was all on the same layer though. Mm-hmm. And if you went in, then it was, uh, it w- you know, there might be more uh, deep gameplay in one little aspect, there, but there wasn't a place where you could sort of dig in. One of the things that scares me, or it, it doesn't scare me, it excites me, but then it scares me at the same time <laughs> is, is the fact that, uh, you know, I had forgotten about the Batman detective stuff. And to me, that puts the fear of God in me and I'll explain why. Cause I, I as I said earlier, one of the things I worry about is that those people who are creating the games are those people who are reflecting what they've played into their gameplay state. Mm-hmm. So they have played this Batman and they think Batman is good in Mass Effect and I'm not 100% of that belief. I'm not 100% of the belief that that should, that all these other aspects of games, No Man's Sky, let's be honest, you can't tell me that the Bioware people haven't played No Man's Sky and, mm-hmm. and looked at those. Um, I want Bioware, I, I would like, I'm sorry, uh, Mass Effect to have its own stuff. And if you and I go into a place in one of these planets and you do feel like, okay, I need to drive here. There's three pieces of something I gra- got to grab. Then I go here, I open the door. And then go- if that happens on multiple planets, I don't know if consumers will be as happy about that as they might have in the past. Because I don't think you're actually that unique, Maddie. I think you're actually... Uh, reflecting what a lot of people I talk to is okay. a burnout, a burnout on open slash hub world gameplay that is repetitive. And Mafia I don't three. Mafia yeah. three, Mafia, Mafia three. And I liked, I liked Mafia three for some of it, but mm. yes, Mafia three, yeah, um, far, far cry titles, uh, far cry titles at times have done that. Um, Assassin's mm-hmm. Creed, you know, I was going to say, let's so. just talk about Ubisoft in general there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so I think, and, and here's the thing, let's say they decide the Batman stuff, they're going to handle it their own way. Mm. Um, and they looked at no man's sky and they took some ideas that they wanted. They put it, I'm, I can't wait. Like, that's going to be great. I just, I'm not a big fan of taking mechanics, which we see all the time from one game and pretending they're new. When I, when I turned it's on Nom new vision to the franchise, right? Is what you're yeah. Saying. Mafia three had its Nom vision, you know, Vietnam vision. And you're like, why do I have heat vision as a mafia or as a, as a <laughs> Vietnam vet? This makes, this is so Damn, weird. Lincoln's got some good senses, man. Yeah. It, exactly. <laughs> Nom vision. And it, the fact that he was able to do that, they saw it in another game and they thought it was good. I want, I want these guys to just do what they want to create without always taking yeah. You know, from others. I, I I'm remember, excited to see what they make. I remember specifically when Dragon Age Inquisition, it didn't have the name Inquisition. It was just, there's a fourth Dragon Age coming. Oh, and, right. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember reading many articles saying they wanted to make a game just like Skyrim. That's exactly what they said, word for word. They said, we want to make another Skyrim. We want the same success and the same scale of Skyrim. They said it inspired us. And, you know, you look at the Hinterlands, that is fucking <laughs> Skyrim. Holy shit. Um, you know, just loads of stuff to do. But like you said, yeah, you're you're entirely right. And I, I often forget that perspective that is this new to the series or is this new to gaming? Now, I know for me personally, I am of the frame of mind that as long as you try to inject unique quests into these planets and stuff, yeah. that uh, really every game has those get X of this or kill yeah. five of that. Fine, because I know, you know, each game isn't, I think they'd run out of ideas if they tried to continuously uh, introduce <laughs> new a stuff. brand new, get a groundbreaking idea. But um, I don't think it would hurt for them to, if you're going to take a page out of any book right now, I'm thinking like The Witcher 3, um, where Skellige sure had the same, get this treasure, here's a, a monster's nest. But you also had this quest where um, this lady's baby, I think, was cursed or something. And, like, you know, you could actually kill it and throw it in the oven. Or you could fake throw it in the oven and someone catch it on the other side. Something along those lines. Like, it was like a really fucking gripping quest. It was nuts. And, um, you know, you had those types of things sprinkled throughout where, yes, you still see that same kill X, collect this. But it also included its own unique quest that now when I think of Skellige... I think of unique moments from that area, making it stand out from what I experienced in Velen, for example. And that is the type of template, if anything, they should take, is not to directly copy them, but that frame of mind. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because, um, you know, it, I think it's good that these, these developers don't stay in their own bubbles and, and think, 
we know what we're fucking doing. We got this. Fuck yeah. these guys. Um, I, I think it's good that they play it so they know what's good and what's bad and that they should keep their ear to the ground and hear what gamers are saying. Uh, with that said, though, I think it's good to look at maybe another game and say, how can we do this better? You know, right. if we're, we're going to take their idea. Let's not just take it directly. Let's do this immensely better. Uh, but then again, I have to say, though, they're stealing from or stealing. I put that in quotes uh, from the Batman Arkham series. I do like the idea of investigating murders. That is a a, a guilty, yeah, it's a guilty blast pleasure. But yeah, Batman. it's just, it's fun. Yeah, it's just a Assassin's fun thing. Creed uh, mm -hmm. actually has you do that. Yeah, the Jack the Ripper stuff. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So. Yeah. So I I think that's a um, side quest line that not a lot of developers think of. It's just murder mysteries because it, it sounds cliche, but it's actually a lot of fun. So I like the idea Mental of that personally. Fun. Yeah. So I I think that's that's a step in the right direction. But it's like, is let's say we got. 20 plans to explore are 11 of them going to offer the murder mystery, you know, like, or yeah. will it be two or three and they will be stand out like this important diplomat was killed or um, you start off a quest with someone, you're helping them out. It feels like a basic fetch quest and it develops into something much more where you come back, they're murdered brutally and it, it ties into this gang and, and that's why you're visiting that gang on that outpost. That'd be cool too, you know? So it's about taking that formula and really building around it, it seems. Yeah, for sure. I think. I, um, oh, go ahead, Nick. Go for it. Uh, you just brought up the uh, the the gang on the outpost, and that that had me thinking earlier. Um, because of the setup of, of Andromeda, that immediately gets you asking questions of, wait a minute, what is this gang doing here, and how is a human already here? Yeah, makes you that, start wondering, and then you realize. I brought that up. I brought that up. That not to interrupt you, but you know, I, I mentioned that in one of my videos, and someone was like, "Well, Maddie, did you not see the initiative?" Um, they said that they're coming in on the what was it the Nexus or the Four Arcs? I, I, I'm getting those mixed up right now. I don't remember exactly, but they were like, basically, they all come into the galaxy together, and 600 years later, uh, they're deploying and and finding new life. But I'm wondering, yeah, how was this gang hideout established? How are there Krogan guards already? How is there a Turian bodyguard standing next to this human? Um, not that I expected a whole full fledged amount of brand new races, but how are these Krogans after just exiting with me, how are they like being their stereotypes from the previous Mass Effect games? Um, that just doesn't make sense to me personally. It really, it, it confuses me and I feel like I'm missing something, but when I asked directly in the comments, I said, thank you guys for the clarification. I, I'm, I'm sorry for missing that, but, um, like how exactly are there already Krogan guards here? Like. If we're all leaving at the same time and we're waking up from cryo sleep at the same time, I don't, I don't get well, no, it. That's exactly why I have the questions about it, because what you just said is exactly right. According to the Andromeda Initiative uh, videos, that's precisely what's going on, is that you all end up there at the same time. Each arc has its own species. Everybody just popped into the same place at once. Wake up 600 years later. So how is it that there's already an established outpost here? What kind of civilization is already here and how long have they been here? How did they get there? What do they have going on? In yeah. fact, I, I'd, I'd wonder if during that initial encounter that we saw from the trailer in the game itself, you're given the option to ask that woman, you're a human. How did you get here? Mm -hmm. That would be so an interesting I, perspective. I might be missing something, but everything I had read was that either Ryder is later uh, in waking up than others or that um, they they're because of where they are, you drop and since travel isn't instantaneous um there there is time to set things up but everything i've read it, it indicated that there was definitely time for things to be set up are you guys saying that because i didn't see whatever video you guys are talking about right now mm -hmm. are you guys saying that there's a video that shows or explains that everybody comes out and everybody drops onto the same planet because if it's different planets it, it, it doesn't even matter if they're two light years away there's still time for them to set stuff up Additionally, one thing that Bioware made clear prior to showing any video, we are an insect-like uh, uh, infestation to the new races or to the old races that are already there, mm. that humans are like considered, um, we are basically the invader. We're the reapers this time. Uh -huh. And so I think it makes total sense if we show up and and this is might be the game, again, I'm just guessing, but I think it makes total sense if we set up and these things are being more dynamically set up than feeling like they've been there forever because a guard only takes a couple days to figure out you yeah. know so it's going to be interesting to know what the narrative is like do you show up and the guys are like you know there's still fucking boxes everywhere and like they're still burning because we've seen that in games how many how many times have we played a game where there's burning in like a destroyed town and it's been like a year and you're <laughs> yeah. all 
what the fuck? Why is everything still on fire? So, <laughs> and again, I'm sort of a logic freak. So those kind of things bother the hell out of me. Mm. But from what I read, and I could be wrong, and I'd love for, if, no, if somebody's I think, listening and they I think know, you're I would love to know. Probably right. I, I I just I haven't seen it. I'm going based off because I didn't know this piece of information. Um, so I did not see the video because I'll be truthful. And I, I've said this before is that I stopped, I started paying attention to Mass Effect Andromeda later. You know, I, I started right. paying attention mm-hmm. to it around the game awards because they've been taking the no man's sky approach. I just knew that Mass Effect Andromeda was a thing. But aside from that, they didn't say much until uh, December 1st. I want to say, you know, they had, I think that, I think that was the first Andromeda initiative was explaining the arcs and the Nexus. And the Nexus is basically the Citadel um, from the first Mass oh, Effect games. Right. right. Um, okay. And I think the arcs were carrying each individual species. But, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd imagine that makes the most sense. I don't think Bioware would have that much of a glaring hole in their story off the bat. <laughs> it makes the most sense that, yeah, Ryder wakes up a little bit later where, you know, even if it's been a, a little bit, just a little bit, that, yeah, there's time for everyone to scatter out and establish. And then you're facing off races. against established races and new ones. Mm. You know, that's what would be cool if, if it's in a shorter time frame. Because a yeah. longer one allows people to set up. A yeah, shorter exactly. one is even more interesting. A shorter one, you got the you're that would actually then imagine if it is longer, how much sense would that make? Would there would there be this um fragile tension almost? That's what if, I mean. If it was, yeah, it could if be. It was shorter, where if it's longer, you know, you'd make more sense to say, well, I guess the problem kind of passed by. Is it really that much of an immediate thing? Where I think if you're in that moment there while everyone's setting up, that'd be that'd be pretty cool. But let's say, hypothetically speaking, and this could be a waste of a conversation, but still, let's say that's not the case that you wake up at the same time as everyone, you just all scatter out. Um, I guess the assumption is that while you're on this planet, this Krogan's setting up on the other planet and he's getting a job there and he's like, okay, hey, how's it going? I'd like to work with you, be your bodyguard or some shit. Um, that could be the case too. I, I, I just, um, I was shocked that you didn't see, from what I, no, from what I remember, you didn't see, aside from enemies you're shooting at, um, that were glaringly, they were, blatant enemies they weren't like potential alien races that uh right. you could interact with um i wonder what kind of new races you're going to be able to communicate with like uh you know the reapers or the um, collectors and stuff along those lines i know they said there's four races that are as big as the turian uh races at mm-hmm. least four so um but the thing is is like if if you know it's not a waste of a conversation if it's just right now and let's say one's on Jupiter, one's on Earth, right? Yeah. It still takes a little bit of time to travel. Plus, the, the great thing about that is stress and danger lead to really weird bedfellows. So the idea of like a Krogan and a fucking, you know, human in some little outpost protecting what little they have. Hmm. And then you show up. And again, Bioware made it clear that that humans are considered to the alien races already on these planets. Humans are considered like the invaders, you know, I that could add Oh, dude, that could add yeah. so much fucking awesome gameplay. Yeah, there is a lot and of backstabbery. Potential. There's a lot of potential, 100. percent Because uh, I'm thinking somehow this is gonna loop back in a way to connecting to the original trilogy. It's mm. uh, I just get a feeling it's going to, and that'll be very cool to see how they handle that. There's a lot of potential within narrative. There absolutely is. It, it can be very good. Um, I'm just thinking of all the things that could happen within the 600 years. That, right. <laughs> that they took on the ship that, that that's exactly from the original games events all the way back to what you're doing it's going to be interesting to see that that clap back from history do you think they're going to show you though nick i mean maybe they don't maybe it's just like that could be another way for bioware to say we're completely separating from the original three let's just be like boom you're in this new place yeah i mean you stopped the reapers in three so it's hmm. like i mean i thought the point of andromeda i'll have to double check that information but i'm pretty sure it was like if the reapers won we need a new place of civilization we need human life to continue because we will all die so um you know here's what because like you remember at the end of three um i forgot what it was called but um there's that explosion based off your choice and that deactivates like all the reapers and stuff and uh cancels their invasion essentially um and my thought is, like, let's say that is the canon ending, which I believe it is. Then what's the threat? And are we just, you know, in this pointless mission for uh, the Milky Way galaxy? Uh, th- these are a lot of questions that uh, probably have been briefly discussed by Bioware, but also that I think are going to be dived in more into a deeper fashion right. um, during Andromeda's story. 
Well, and they destroyed the um, the relay. So if if they left prior to to three's ending, then they wouldn't even be able. I mean, would they even know that noth- that it, the Reapers had been defeated? Mm-hmm. But here's the cool thing, guys. Do you, does anybody else abli- agree with me? Do you know what I wish this game was about? I wish this game was about the trip, like Battlestar Galactica. I Instead of different planets, it was different spaceships. <laughs> and it was like you were like a, a detective. Your your job was like to keep peace on this giant flotilla of... Because it's like in, in right now, it's going to be 600 years, right? Mm. 600 years after... And there's this missing time, and Nick, when he brought it up, <laughs> it made my brain go, oh my god, the cooler story wouldn't be a repeat of the Mass Effect-style stuff with planets. The cooler story to me would be the Battlestar Galactica uh, keeping hu- keeping humanity, Krogan, all those races, like, wanting to go to one place together. I don't know. I just thought so, that would be awesome. <laughs> here's, a, uh, here's a quick synopsis of what we know of the plot so far, just to uh, yeah, go bring any it. clarification. The game takes place 600 years after the events of the first three Mass Effect games in the Andromeda Galaxy. That's when you wake up. The player's character's intergalactic journey began during the time in which Mass Effect 2 takes place, separating the new setting from the events of the third game. Players choose from the male or female sibling, uh, with the other continuing to feature in the story. I didn't know about that, actually. Oh, they are the children of Alec Ryder, a N7 Special Forces soldier, and designated as a Pathfinder, an operative test with discovering new planets for the human species to colonize. They will explore an open world galaxy aboard the Starship Tempest. So basically, um, they're just discovering new planets for human species to continue living on. I don't know if it's necessarily for a, an escape plan for Mass Effect 3, um, but this plot emphasizes saying separating the new setting from the events of the third game. Does that mean that uh, the third game is... Are they attempting to cancel that out because of all the controversy with the ending that the third game, I don't want to say doesn't matter, but it's separated from that where it happens after two, where um, it it gives room for the Andromeda plot to breathe without the thought of what happens with Mass Effect 3, though. Is that potentially what they're doing here? It very well could be. I mean, after all, because at, during Mass Effect 3, for instance, somebody who's never really dove into the games but knows the franchise wants to get into it someday. Here's all this controversy about this big, awful ending to this massive trilogy that was hugely successful until the company screwed it up. Mm-hmm. They have to fix it on a patch. The coverage is everywhere. You can't escape from it. The news about Mass Effect 3, everybody knows about it. So as a potential player, well, there goes your chances of really getting into a storyline that's going to be worth it <laughs> at the end. Right. So how do you fix that as a company? You do a soft reboot that separates it from the original, a clean slate, like they're giving us now. So maybe Carrick Car- Car brought up the question of, will they bring in the history whatsoever? And you did just bring that up as well, Manny. You know... There's a damn good chance that they won't. Exactly. That's because of that company angle of, you know what? Mm -hmm. We screwed up with the public. Potential players may not touch our stuff now unless we do a real soft sort of reboot that's separated from the previously poisoned product. That might be the solution right there that we just kind of uncovered. We might be late to that, but... um... I'd like them to directly comment on that if they haven't yet, that uh, they're they're leaving behind Mass Effect 3. Because that, that's seemingly what they're doing, right? They're, uh, I think their goal is, yes, to do what you would call, uh, that's a great term, is a soft reboot and uh, depart from the original franchise at the end of what was probably the most uh, fully complete and successful Mass Effect title that accounted your choices from the previous entry as well as making crucial decisions um, throughout the second entry. And uh, tailoring off from there and pretending 3 never really happened. Because then I'd imagine they're thinking, okay, a plot will develop, a, a new enemy will appear in the Andromeda Galaxy. And from there, uh, it will take, a, you know, a, a new conflict will take form there where it's like, you know, we have our own problems to deal with. You know, the Milky Way can wait, almost. Um, I think it really depends. I think those first that first hour or two is going to be crucial setup from the sounds of it. Even with the answers we have here, it sounds like they have to do it like just right to really set what where the story's going. Yeah, and it's, it's the idea of like showing up and being all, oh, we don't know what happened, but uh, mm. we're here now. They they may do that because <laughs> like the more I think about it, the more I'm like, if if I don't 
I don't even know if they'll do a soft reboot. What they may do, is, uh, restoring confidence, companies talk about it, but what they may do is they may just uh, ignore the situation completely and not talk about it. They may just be like, no one knows. And so we, all we can say is what the characters in Andromeda know, which they oh. don't have any clue after two. You know, um, go for it. Just looked up an article on Eurogamer. Why, your, uh, why Mass Effect Andromeda won't acknowledge your ME3 ending choice? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so the others are thinking about it. So this was published uh, June 20th, actually my birthday, 2016. So it's a recent article. Uh, Bioware has decided to leave behind Mass Effect 3's controversial ending choices rather than letting them impact the upcoming Mass Effect Andromeda. Uh, Andromeda has been in development since late 2012, and this year's E3 press conference marked the third year in a row the game has been teased. This year, many fans were hoping for a big reveal. Instead, Bioware's brief trailer showed little we didn't already know. Big questions remain around Andromeda's setting and characters and how much will be influenced by the original trilogy. For answers, Game Informer caught up with Bioware... Uh, studio boss Aaron Flynn and the Mass Effect creative uh, Mac Walters, who confirmed Mass Effect Andromeda would not acknowledge your personal trilogy ending decision in order to ensure the game works as a fresh chapter for the franchise. We acknowledged it in the endings of Mass Effect 3, and I think that's where we want to leave it for now, Flynn said. Uh, we want this to be a new story, and it would be... <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm trying not to laugh, too. We want this to be a new story, and it would be very hard to say it's a new story, but also you need to understand how the past trilogy ended. Andromeda's setting naturally uh, places it beyond the Milky Way, changing consequences of Mass Effect 3's explosive finale. Each of the player's options, uh, each of the options available to the player, were spread across the galaxy via mass relays, but no further. By moving geographically uh, beyond the reaches of this choice, Bioware has also negated the need for a canon ending. You know uh, what they're going to do? They're going to be three games after these next three games, where you go, where you try to build up a ship to go back to the Milky Way to find out what happened there. And that'll, be the, <laughs> and that'll and that'll be the official ending. And that'll be the official. I think we just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you that entire and article was kind of like yeah. their way of saying, hey, guys, remember that yeah. embarrassing thing we did? No hey, more. neither do we. Check out this new product we have. That's, yeah, they. Uh... I, I know what they're going to do. They will. They'll be like, we don't know what happened at the end of three. And then you'll like build a ship and they'll be like, oh, OK, it's God, been 600 years. Be Let's so go see different. what humans look like again. It would be be awesome. It'd be awesome to show back up in the Milky Way. Humans are like, (laughs) we're humans and dogs mating. (laughs) That'd just be awesome. Dumans. My God, man. Yeah, Dumans. No, I I think we actually hit the nail on the head, though. That sounds pretty fucking accurate. Hey, you know what? Yeah, because PS4 or PS6 and uh, Xbox One number 14 will both uh, launch with, you know, Mass Effect 7 or what would that be? Three, four. Yeah, it's Mass Effect 7. Yeah, it's good. I mean, that's great. I think that that's the best way to do it. We discussed it before. You know, you can either not answer the question and then just let it be ambiguous. He answered it and he basically just said they traveled outside the Milky Way, which means the Reapers don't matter. And we traveled prior to three, so we don't know the ending, so it doesn't matter. And that's pretty much, that's that's how you do it. Yeah. that's. Uh, he bleached it. Yeah. Damage it, control. They, they, I was going <laughs> to say, they really uh, just went ahead and completely pretended three didn't happen i mean that's that's insane to think about i know we're a little late to that but um it's just you know it's not a headline i think of like hey remember this this game that most people loved until the last five minutes yeah that didn't happen um it's <laughs> it's very at least it as far does as not I know, exist yeah i was gonna say it's, just, it's very rare for a game company to make a spinoff i guess you could call it to cancel out the last game in the franchise. That's actually fucking crazy. <laughs> well, they took it very hard. I know that um, you guys heard about the muffin story where no. they, they at the end of three, um, some fans baked a muffins in three colors, red, blue, and green That's as a, as a joke. And I guess it, I guess it sounds really stupid, but the complex action of making food to make a joke devastated some people on the team. Well, they yeah, were like it's people such an hate extra, this. Yeah, it was it's such, an such an extra, extra step. Yeah, and so they and 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 when I mean devastated, I don't mean they were sitting there crying and cutting themselves. What I mean is they were going, okay, like we can't let that happen again. Like we can't mm-hmm. promise something because it wasn't hated just because of the ending. It was hated because they distinctly promised exactly what we wouldn't get, which is what we got. They distinctly yeah. said you will not get three color choices in interviews and gave us three three color, color choices. choices. Yeah. So. 
Um, that's what excites me is that, and I don't mean it excites me because it devastated them because that's just mm -hmm. rude. But what I mean is when you create that psychological impact on somebody, there's a chance that that will drive everybody and yes, be like, they guys, will learn from their mistakes. They will, yeah. And, and, yeah. um, and, 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 and the mistake being in all honesty, and this is me being brutally honest, if they hadn't told us it wouldn't have three colored endings, at least for me, I would have not liked the ending, but I would have never had the reaction I had. Yeah. Do um, you think... It, do you think that's why they're being so quiet with Mass Effect Andromeda? Yeah. Do you think yeah. that's why they're like, mm, yeah, we're not going to talk about it much. Um, almost a, a No Man's Sky approach where they're not really, uh, they're, they're definitely giving us more and more. We definitely have a good idea about but Mass I think Effect Andromeda. But I think, it, yeah. yeah, I think they're trying to avoid as many interviews and questions and stuff as possible. Yeah. Um, that's, that's very yeah. interesting. Nick, um, you run, what, what you, what's the uh, crux of your YouTube channel, Nick? Like, what is it? The crux of my YouTube channel is, um, Basically, internet fiction and internet storytelling, uh, online horror and dark media. If it's something that an independent creator makes, that's a form of story using all different assets of the tools that are available online through the internet and through software. I cover it. So, is there a is there anything that that's sort of like in that sphere that's like this, where like an ending for a movie or an ending, or even for a book, where there's been this much like hubbub about it that you know, where people were like really upset by something like that. Is there like a, by something in my, hmm. Is there like a actually connection? Actually, yes. Oh, go yes, go for it. Been, there have been a few cases of some really wild stuff happening in my sphere. Okay, so one of the biggest things that I've ever covered, and one of the deepest things I've ever covered, is called the Wyoming incident. The Wyoming incident is one of the oldest alternate reality games to ever appear online, and possibly one of the oldest creepy boss legends to ever appear. Uh -huh. It started in March of two thousand six. And it's still ongoing, mostly Holy because um, in the game, there were about three or four turnarounds where it was like, the game is a joke by something awful. No, the game is not a joke. It's legitimate. And now it's being investigated by a detective group. No, it's not being uh, <laughs> investigated by a detective group. We're actually a cult. <laughs> and then, then it comes back three years later after dying, starts up the game again, and then leads to a fake ad for cash for gold saying we're now being funded by cash for gold and then it's a joke again and then it comes back to holy life holy shit no shit that's yeah, where so it takes three or four turns in a row and it just so says have fans off. reacted to that like what you hear from i mean do did fans like you know burn me once is fine right like we've all been burned once and you're like ha, you got me but after the <laughs> third time did did like people were like we are finding your house and we are burning it down <laughs> did, did you have any kind that's of response that is actually a little bit of what happened. The really interesting thing, if you, if anybody were to go to my channel right now, um, they would find that the latest video is called The Wyoming Incident Returns. Uh -huh. Because after three years of silence, it just came back, and it came back hard, and it came back seriously after a previous incarnation where they were being serious about it again. So this is a story that you you still don't know whether or not the ending is a middle finger or a genuine story ending and reward. But mm. I have talked to a few people about the Wyoming incident returning, and some of them have said that they know people who were involved all those years ago. And after the first reveal, they swore they will never come back. Mm. So yes, it is possible with one big mistake, even if right. it's not intentional, and even if, even if you were going to wreck on it later, you could destroy your entire property and piss off people enough that they will never come back to you. So this mm. this is a good choice. Then I think it's I think it's perfect. I think Matt, I think these guys have made the best choice. Then with yeah. what I mean, just be like, um, yeah, we left early. <laughs> we left. We didn't see the ending of the movie. We left early. We got some jujubes. We took off, <laughs> and uh, and we're in a different uh, we're in a different solar system, motherfuckers. So it doesn't matter. And yeah. that's per. I mean, that's that's and legitimately that's, smart. That definitely, I think, sets them up to wrap it around the Mass Effect 3 and, and conclude both those. Because who knows if, uh, are they predicting Andromeda will be successful enough, um, which I'm imagining they titles. are based off the interest. Yeah, but will it be successful enough to, you know, have three titles? I, I think one, I'm trying to remember the ending as best as I can, but I think one was a, a well-rounded conclusion. There wasn't like a it plot was. hole to, yeah, set up a, a, a sequel. I wonder if they're going to do that with Andromeda and loop it back to three. Um close all those arcs and then maybe start up with another sequel for andromeda 
It's just like, what do you call it? Do you call it Andromeda 2 at that point? Um, because that just doesn't sound right to me. Um, because, you know, at least Mass Effect Andromeda, that sounds like its own separate spinoff. It's like, then after all these events, is it like Mass Effect so-and-so? Um, oh, I see. now I get what you're saying. Sorry, yeah. this entire time I, I was confused by what you're saying. I, I get... I don't know. I personally think it's going to be three titles based in Andromeda, especially because we're going to be the invaders. There's a, 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 a creepy, unique, really odd feeling about yeah, that. Yeah, it's like almost that ironic. They can prime. Yeah. I mean, there can be so many... Like, yeah, you, what, if, what if your arc, for example, what if um, one of the main story arcs of this is like humans running out of food, so you have to go to a planet, but the planet's already got people. What do you do? Like... Do you do deals oh. with them to oh. get them, or do you just say, screw it, humans are landing? You know, like, you have some mm. dark-ass choices you can make. You know, provided you can just provide be provide them, right? Oh, dude, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> well yeah, <laughs> provided. <laughs> <laughs> provided yeah. they don't just say, in a cutscene before you showed up, yeah. we did this. And you're like, that's what I wanted to do. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that makes me think that, you, you know, I love stuff that's... Um, starts out really light and then it and it slowly yeah. reveals its darkness underneath and now that you're saying that and you're and you're reminding us that um the storyline basically it's revealed that we are the infestation we are yeah um if you look at andromeda initiative the, the actual website and the videos like just looking at the page right now myself it's got this it feels like one of the fallout posters from back in the day before <laughs> the pre-war stuff where it's so hopeful it's it's this da- it's this father holding his daughter pointing up at this beautiful ship and it's so nice and it's such good propaganda of we're journeying beyond the stars to find yeah, a new like hope right join thing. us in this amazing journey for humanity and it's so brilliant and bright and there's so much light and optimism and then you realize oh shit mm-hmm. we're the bad guys and then you're stuck in a situation 600 years from home, and it's either survive, do some bad things, or try to keep your morals and your humanity in this place yeah, you're, where you're trying you to realize colonize your humanity. In- see, see, do you wipe everyone out and just say, fuck exactly. this, we're thinking of well, ourselves? Or do you try to live in harmony with these people and establish some type of peace for humans to begin colonizing? I mean, there is there's remember- some room for some powerful storytelling here. Really one is. of their favorite books, um, they were talking about their favorite novels, and the two leads both uh, were saying uh, Starship Troopers. And so if you understand how to do propaganda, and you understand how Starship Troopers is, and you understand like what we, because technically in those books we were the bad guys, though we appeared to be the good guys, mm-hmm. you actually realized, oh shit, we're actually the bad guys. Um, there's Friends a lot the, of uh, connections right there that could end up turning out to be, I mean, it would be great to, yeah, to slowly get darker and darker to where... Like in number two or three, you're making decisions that there is just, and I've said this before and I know everybody doesn't agree with me, but what do you do when every choice hurts? And I love that. Like to me, yes. when you're just sitting there going like, oh, mother of God, like, what do we do? And you're you're yeah. like, do we help the humans or do we let them starve on the ark? Or, but there mm. are people, you know, Who, and, you know, a game that you look at as a shining example of every choice hurts, spec ops the line. Yeah. Hands right. down. <laughs> You do Definitely. not make it. You do not make a good choice in that game. I mean, um, Lone's brought up this example before, and it's just a fantastic one. Is that you think you're doing the right thing? You think you're wiping out all the enemies? You're in this AC one one thirty. You see white targets, just rain and fire. Like you know, it's a shooter. I'm killing right. the enemies. I'm destroying tons of people. It's not my conscience. It's his. Whatever. And then you find out that those people were actually civilians that you killed. It's like you guys need to watch Black Mirror. <laughs> I own. I, yeah, I've seen them all. Yeah. You've seen them all. Then you yeah. know the episode that that I'm thinking of right now. Yes, I do. And the thing, so the thing about Black Mirror, the thing about any of those that like point, you know, sort of twist, like your your perception of what's going on. That's what I'm hoping. That is literally, and I don't mean as dark as Black Mirror, because being honest, those are pretty dark. Like, oh yeah, those, like, those, will, those will kill your soul. Th- those, are, those, also. those will, yeah, they will kill you. <laughs> they will, they will literally make you be like, I like cutting now, but <laughs> I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but if they, if these guys, you know, and we saw a couple choices, by the way, in uh, Dragon's Age Inquisition, there were a couple missions that were very dark. In mm-hmm. fact, technically, the ending and the twists, there, there's there's some darkness there. So yeah. if you saw, like, if we see that in one, just a hint of like, 
you know, you know that foolishness where we think we're the good guys. You hear about it in America. It's like Americans think they're good guys, and then other people are like, "We hate you. You invade everything." <laughs> blah, blah. Um, yep. If they if they handle it de- with some dexterity, holy shit, could that be like some great narrative? Yes. Those are some great. of my favorite story types where where the character has this major revelation that does show them a very dark reality. Versus yes. their perception of it, which they thought was a lot more positive. I Am Legend is probably True. one of the first That's books of all time to to really indicate what was going on mm-hmm. there. That it was a completely different idea of what was occurring. Well, it plays with your expectations. That's why you you go in like as a, a genuine human being playing a game. You're like, I'm the good guy, of course, right? right. And um, turns out that you know you do some things. You're like, is was this for the greater good? I don't know. And it really makes you question your choices. Uh, a good example is. Um, in Knights of the Old Republic 2, any choice you make, Kreia, whether you make the good choice or the bad choice, whatever playthrough you're on, Kreia will tell you what you did wrong with that choice. Yeah, right. She will right. leave you questioning, wondering, did I make the right decision there? I mean, eventually, after like 40 fucking playthroughs, you go, oh, she doesn't like anything I do. She's trying to make, yeah. you know, she's, <laughs> right. she's trying to make sure I am aware of, you know, was this the right choice? You know, I got to really put the a lot gray. of thought in this. Yeah, the gray. And, That's a um, good character to have, though, as well, because it keeps mm-hmm. you on your toes. Exactly. It keeps you thinking about your decision and exactly. also about the impact that other people want to have on you. Mm-hmm. And, well, that's, and develop- what's, oh. that's what's beautiful about uh, Knights of the Republic 2, I think, is that. Yeah. That um, it's not only how you'll say something and one of the two companions you have with you, behind you, might chime in and be like, I don't know about that. Uh, not only that, but you're all connected to the Force that you do something dark, that might lead them down the same path. So you're responsible for your party mates. But also that, yeah, you know Kray is going to chime in and say, like, ah, that not the best choice, dude, no matter what. Or uh, really make you think, you know, what if you did this? Did you ever think what would happen if you decided to save these people or something along those lines? Um, like you said, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very useful character to have. Because even playing it through the, I don't even know what time at this point. But, um, you know, it, it just, I, I am still left, huh. You know, what if I did things differently? Obviously, I know what's going to happen on the other side, but it, it definitely, when you're engaged in that playthrough, you're involved in that experience. Right. You definitely wonder in that moment, well, what if? You know, did I make the right choice? And I think that shows how powerful of a narrative tool that is, that even though I played it over and over and over, that I still am left at times like, was that the right decision? Because she makes good points when she contradicts or uh, tries to tackle with some logic what you've done. Yeah, in development, um, there's they're called uh, compass decisions. But compass decisions are basically you have seven decisions with an NPC. The fourth one and the seventh one indicate if you made a good choice or not, and uh, by feedback. So you'll make a couple, nothing will be said. You'll make that third or fourth one, and an NPC, whether on your team or somebody, will say, "Yeah, I agree." Blah blah, blah. and that's it's a gameplay mechanic to basically make you know that you took the right choices. the mm-hmm. The thing that happened in Kotor too is if you took Kreia with you. She did not give you those. Kreia was purposely the 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 void there, and that's one yeah. of the things I liked about her. I wasn't a huge fan of two um, as much as I was one, but that's mm-hmm. and that and that and so that also brings up the aspect like, are these guys looking as far back as that? Because if you look as far back as Jade Empire, then you have the same thing with Sky and a couple other characters who were were not as good as, you know, some of those characters were not as good as they pretended to be. Some were worse, some were better. Uh, the bad guys were good guys. Uh, it depends on how far back Bioware's going, but my hope is it would be very cool if we get those kind of nuanced characters in, in Andromeda. Like, really nuanced, where they don't always barometer you. I don't like it when I'm constantly informed I did right. I know that mm-hmm. sounds weird, but no, I, I don't need it. Yeah, I don't need an NPC to be like, here's a verbal pat on the back. Yeah, uh, I was, every just, I was just thinking about how how novel that concept is of having a choice having a choice based RPG where you're not given a pilot light about whether or not what you did was good or bad, because we always seem to have that. So taking that away from the player and leaving it in their hands to figure out firsthand, seeing the effects and then making that decision without NPC input. Right. It's a really interesting idea. I also yeah, think, I, though, that there's something to be said um, for NPC reactions to the choices you make, because while um, that might be, like you said, the verbal pat on the back, I think of in real life, you know, you make a choice. I can't think of an example right now, but when someone says, like, 
oh, that's why, you know, is, you know, is that what you think is right? Or, you know, something along those lines. Or I don't know if I agree with that. Um, it's not them directly saying, like, bad decision, man. But it, it just puts that slight doubt in your head for a moment. Um, and you could oh, apply no. that same way of thinking. I want that doubt all the time. No, okay. you're right. Yeah, I'm just saying <laughs> the same thing for, like, uh, you know, the, the, the positive affirmation. You know, like in real life, uh, you know, you, you could have um, some decision you make and your friend can just, like, pat you in the back and be like, hey, man, I, sure. I'm with you on this. You know, not directly saying, like, Good choice, you know, you're on the light side path of this story now, uh, but it, it more so just establishing a relationship, but maybe having another person step in and, and just kind of like shaking their head or something um, to let you know that, like, you, you get that feeling of, yeah, I made the, wait, you know, and you think you're, you think you have it all right until someone shows a, a sign of doubt. I think overusing that can be damaging too, though, because then you start going, well, I don't give a fuck, none of you are happy with what I do anyway. Yeah, well, I think that is that the I... answer that comes with it. I think one of the problems is is we're peeling the layer now sort of down into two layers. And so it, the, the thing is, you don't always need an NPC because the game world state itself will inform you if you did well as well. That too. So yeah. so what I'm what I was saying is I want ambiguity at almost all time. I'm not saying I don't want the occasional barometer, but what I would love is that it wasn't always given to me via NPC and it wasn't always given to me versus successful mission completion. Now, Will this happen? Probably not. But do you know what I would love? I would love to succeed in a mission and still fucking lose somehow. I know yeah. that people would hate that, but I would love to be doing a mission in Mass Effect mm -hmm. and be like, we took this over, and then I don't know what would happen, but but that dynamic feeling of, oh, shit. Because in games, and it happens in movies, for example, Steven Seagal being killed in um, the movie uh, with John Leguizamo. Oh, God, he was killed in the first 10 minutes, and people freaked out. And the director said, why did you kill Steven Seagal in the first 10 minutes? And he said, so that no one would be safe for the rest of the movie. No <laughs> actor will ever be safe. They also killed uh, Channing Tatum. Tatum, is that his name? Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in G.I. Joe 2, they killed him right at the starting. They said, why did you do wow. that? So that no, Steven Summers is a big believer that no character should be safe from that point on. So that would be awesome to be like, no success is safe. Like, I did it. And then they're like, yeah, but, and I don't mean artificially you can't be artificial about it mm -hmm. but i mean like real world events that continue to happen so that they don't feel like a one-off to penalize the gamer yeah but like fucking things rolling forward and you're like i gotta do this i gotta do it and it doesn't always work out yeah i think a, a good example and i keep bringing up this title because i've been researching it for a video but the witcher 3 uh did exactly what you're talking about where it wasn't really an npc reaction i mean it was through an npc but you'll get what i'm saying in a second it's during the bloody baron quest line um, at the end, you have the choice yeah. to um, essentially destroy, I think it's the Willow Spirit. And uh, if you do, then, uh, you know, you, you save Anna and the Baron walks away, but these children die. On the other hand, and mind you, that's not a fairy tale ending whatsoever, but that's considered widely as the good ending. That doesn't sound too good to me that a bunch of children die. But on the other hand, um, if you fail, to, we'll say just fail for the sake of uh, discussion and to not give out blatant spoilers... Um, you walk back to the crow's perch and you see the Baron hanging from a tree and w the witcher just kind of Geralt looks up and just sees that. And he's like, what the fuck just happened? You know? A and it's because Anna died and, and you know, that's his reaction to it that he, he couldn't take it anymore and he just kills himself. And it's like, yeah. you know, that's the game really not saying anything to you. Just you, you walk into town as the cutscene starts and you just see like half his body hanging from a tree it's like holy shit you know yeah. so that's really powerful stuff and i think that's exactly what you're looking for where it's that um granted it's through an npc it's a reaction to what happened but uh it, it's in the game world after that um he is on the tree you know what i'm saying so yeah it, it's like a reminder of the decision you made i think that type of story you know i agree that um they they should take their item no decision safe um that at least a couple did, times comes, right yeah yeah that you know what decision you made at least came with some sacrifice of, of someone um and leave it up to the player on how much they give a fuck about that you know if you're if you're out for a power trip and you you kick a couple of people off the planet who are desperate dying and, and all that stuff and they they need the resources here but you're like i need to colonize for humanity get the fuck out or else i'll kill you all um and and, and you like see you know I, I don't know how you could bump into these people when they leave the planet but um find a way to remind you that uh, those starving people paid the price ultimately and to, to remind you that decision was made and uh, 
Yeah, you called that, and they are dead because of you. Well, I think that there's a chance, because remember, in Mass Effect 3, they had the lady who kills herself if you let her have the gun. Mm. Do, you, do, you, do you guys even remember that? It's mm. the sub-quest. It's not even a full cutscene quest. They sort of hint at it. But there's the chick who keeps talking in the hospital ward, and if you keep talking to her, she starts talking about needing a gun, and you can give her the gun by going into the uh, Sentinels, um, into your hideout on, on the planet, or on the uh, Citadel, and you can say, allow her to requisition a uh, handgun. And when you return to the hospital, she's dead. She shot herself. And it's not a big thing in Mass Effect 3. They never tell you. Unless you read in between the lines, they never tell you you just helped her kill herself. Yeah, that's and the kind of stuff that I love. That's, oh, yeah. I mean, if I was reading... Like, let's say, Maddie had a perfect example. You kick some people out of a settlement. Instead of instantly saying, and now you're a bad guy. Do you know what I'd like? I'd like to, like have a commander come up to me a little bit later and be like, uh, commander, we have some information. There was some debris from a ship that looks like it was trying to escape orbit, but it looks like it fell apart because it didn't have enough, you know, gas or whatever. And they're like, there's two bodies on board and a male and a female. And you're like, um, okay. Right. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Not sure what happened. Fire. <laughs> Fire torpedoes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Not so, ex yeah. Yeah, those and are then after that point, certain characters are just a little bit more skeptic around you. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Here's the thing, though: so we're, we're we're talking about a lot of the negative repercussions. How can you do that through a positive light? With you know, it seems like the only way you could do that um, is that yeah, we don't want any decisions to be unsafe. But we, I think, we shouldn't have the player being like at times that uncertainty of like it's a good uncertainty. But I think there are moments in the game where it's good to to have that definitive bad choice and that definitive good choice. Um, it's obvious how to do a definitive bad choice, but for good, how do you do that in a unique fashion? To really, instead of that, like you said, that verbal pat on the back, like, you know, good job. Um, how do you show that through the game world where if you, um, I don't know, if you do establish say, some if you power pylons that you'll incidental see Incidental information through animations. Yeah, that's what I think. One, one of the cool things um, that, I, that I liked a lot about Mafia 3, actually, is when you finish taking over a racket and you mm -hmm. decide to elect a building to a specific gang... That building fills up with members of that gang. And as you're going through there as Lincoln Clay, you know, they say, hey, what's up, Lincoln? Or they start talking to you about things in that building, how the racket's going. Mm -hmm. um, the club, the club at the beginning of the game that you take back, uh, Perla's Club, you get to see what that transformed into because of your actions and how much a better that place is. Those little hints of incidental information that you see through animations that are set up as a result of your actions that you can witness in the game world as your character, but it's no cutscene. It's no button to interact and hear dialogue. Right. You're just right. going around and maybe they say something to you sporadically, or you're just witnessing something that you didn't even realize they put in their heads to program in the game. But they thought of that. Yeah, it's a good example because compared to when you walk outside of that place, you made real significant change and you have people saying racist stuff to you, usually threatening you left and right compared to when you're in there where they're like, hey, man, good job. You know, look at, look at what you've done. So that's a, that's a very good point. That's a, a good example within that title. I think they'll probably do something like that. But um, remember, Mass Effect removed the ability to talk to your partners in, I think it was Mass Effect 1, actually, you, you weren't able to. So prior games, you could turn to your characters, your other NPCs, and talk to them directly by clicking on them. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Mass Effect 1 that got rid of that. I hope they add that again. I, I loved in KOTOR being able to be like, stop, I want to talk to Atten, or I want to talk to um, you know one of the characters and just sit and talk to them versus incidentals which happens mm -hmm. in in the mass effect series i think that's one I thing agree. they really failed on is is removing that if there's anything well, that's that's why um I, I think they will have that because that's why you have the um the tempest for example where everyone's relaxing you could stop talk to them and but people I agree, move I, around yeah i i agree that that i'd rather it be while i'm exploring like okay hold up we just had a big right. significant moment in this quest i want to catch up with everyone see how they're doing afterwards um, not in a Fallout 4 style, your thoughts, you know, bullshit, but um, more of a <laughs> actual, like, you know, a significant wheel with options like, you know, where I can really dive deep into what they're thinking about uh, what has just happened. And um, one thing Bioware games have done very well is that if you don't talk to someone at a certain point in time, um, where if you're, for example, I think it's in Origins, if you visit a new city or something like that, that you'll have new conversation options about 
that particular city. And um, if someone resided there in an er uh, earlier time in their life, you know, asking them about memories of that place, where if you're in, um, you know, your typical camp, there will be different options and uh, stuff to discuss with them. And I think that's important because that engages the player to um, a, a different level rather than, uh, you know, just going to a new city. It's like, you know, this is, isn't just me exploring this. This is my companions exploring this new environment with me. What yeah. is their history here? What do they think about this place? You know, that I think that's also important as well. But, um, man, this has been no, a I definitely discussion. agree on that one. It, it, make, it makes you think about all, all of the things, the little things in, in life when it comes to other people and circumstances of getting feedback on things that could and sometimes should be replicated in the game world. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's one of them. Though those moments where you're you're waffling on whether or not to talk to somebody about something, but you make that decision, and because you made that that split moment decision, you you get information that you otherwise wouldn't have had, or you make an impact that wouldn't have been on that person if you hadn't stopped to speak to them in the moment. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and I think it it brings the moment you were just in to another level where. Uh, you know how they react. I, I think uh, KOTOR 2, once again, I'm going to bring that up as a good example where you're on Nar Shada and um, you bump into a gang of just two aliens and they're like, you know, watch out for that guy. And, uh, you know, he, he's very sketchy. And Atten doesn't even say anything until you confront Atten. And at that point in time, it is a, I believe, uh, mind you, this is Obsidian, we're talking about not even Bioware, but um, still is an example of how it works so well that... Um, I, I think, you know, a, after a certain point, you can't bring that up. Um, but in that moment, it's more impactful to turn around and be like, you know, Adam, these guys just, like, called you out. What's going on? And you start finding out how he's a, uh, you know, he's a professional Jedi assassin. And he's trying to walk away from that life. And you can lead him back into that life at that point and, and start this um, real deep engagement with Atten, or you can lead him towards the light, convince him he's not that bad of a guy that, you know, everyone makes mistakes and, and how to move on from that. Um, all just from this simple NPC encounter and, and instantly turning around and, and talking with your party member uh, brings about one of my favorite moments in that entire game. And I think it's just amazing to think that that was so minuscule yet so big. That entire bit of storyline that was only accessible if you took that one single moment, mm-hmm. that's pretty incredible. Yeah, exactly. Um, at least as far as I know, I'm pretty sure... I think you can like if you go back on the Evan Hawk, you can you can talk to him about it because it, it leads more directly down his uh, companion affinity route sort of thing where you, you know you make him either light or dark uh, based off the stuff you say to him. But still, uh, it, it's still that impact of in the moment and how much it stands out because of such a little thing that extra step. You know, I didn't just flip through the conversation or half pay attention during it because you know I played it through a bunch of times. It was like hold on, why are these guys talking about Atten? How do they know him? And, and you sp- talk to him about it, and, and you start learning about who he really was before you found him on Paragus in this mining facility uh, trapped in a cell. You know, why was he in that cell? Um, he does explain that originally, but, you know, why is he in this life of crime? Why are people all around you skeptical of him? Why does he not get along with people? You start to learn that on a deeper level, all through simple conversation. Um, yeah, and remember the best part about that character. I don't know if you remember Maddie. Well, I'm sure you do. You play it more than I do. But uh, <laughs> I love when you would eavesdrop on him and he'd be counting and he'd be doing yeah. the math in his head. And you were like, what the fuck is this guy? Is he like, I mean, is he Rain Man? What the fuck yeah. is going on? Yeah. And then you find out why he does it. And you're like, oh, oh, oh that's yeah. awesome. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it breaks canon quite quickly when yeah. you find out that basically just by doing math, uh, you you know Jedi mind <laughs> skills don't work, but it was it was a very cool idea that maybe he he also had some other skills that he he mended in. Mm-hmm. I think this is get, the the cool thing about this game is we're all going to be able to sit when it gets released. They say this year, right? Yes, yeah, it's uh, March March third. It's March third. No, that's 3rd? the switch. Okay. That's the switch. March oh, yeah. twenty twenty something. Twenty first, okay. I think. Okay. So they're still saying this year, we haven't seen a lot. And you look at the time, you still got a month and a half, you know, so so we've got so, some time for some from d- delays if they want to delay it. I hope they don't. But what's cool is that means in will. like it means in two months we'll be able to sit back and go, you know, like how much did they get from Dragon's Age Inquisition and its success because it succeeded? How much did they get from Mass Effect 3's ending, which didn't go so well? How much do they get from like removing themselves from Mass Effect completely and doing their own 
series. It's going to be so fucking awesome because, like you said, that first hour, Maddie, I'm going to probably be more excited than I've been in games in a long time. Because, mm-hmm. again, Mass Effect 1 was one of my favorite things of all time. So to sit there and just go, how's this first hour, like, yeah, how is it, it going to play oh, out? It's dude, so it's going to be. I'm going to be on Twitter with you, going like, "Did you see that?" <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I need to. I need to. I was telling you about this uh, going off track. I need to figure out how the fuck I'm going to get a review copy for that because I I know sure as shit EA isn't providing. I know sure as shit, dude. So I got to figure that one out, man. Because uh, I know I for sure want to review it because I know a lot of. Um, YouTube content creators for Mass Effect Andromeda have a uh, a bit of optimism for it, and I understand why. But um, it doesn't seem cautious optimism, which I think this game should have because of some of Bioware's mm. track record. Not just oh, Mass Effect's awesome. It's like, well, have you seen a little bit of the between three and and now? Because uh, it hasn't been pretty. So uh, I'm, I'm really really. <laughs> that's hoping. like uh, that's like the image I, I saw circulating on uh, Twitter and Tumblr the other night after the Switch presentation of the guy who was talking about his girlfriend who was super hype up after the presentation and he had her sit down with a with a collector's box of No Man's Sky and said, I made her hold the remember box. <laughs> oh, ouch. Ouch. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we're speaking to gamers, uh, you know, I've said it multiple times, more intelligent because of the internet, more jaded because of the internet, but more excited because of the internet. So mm. the, the problem is, is the ups and downs are higher and um, it's hard to go into it not being like, I mean, cautiously optimistic is great. Like, I don't see a problem with that. I think overly optimistic with with almost any game is it's probably dangerous. Yeah. is dangerous uh, from a financial standpoint because gamers, the everybody I know who's a gamer just doesn't have that much money to to frivolously throw away sixty bucks. I think hey, if they did, if do, they wouldn't be watching be, me as a reviewer. Yeah, but even then, I don't think it uh, like it's something that you should toss away. Even if you're financially well off, I don't think you should just because then you're supporting a bad practice, right? Then you're just. Right, okay. but I'm talking. I'm I'm talking removing removing the morals of it all. Okay. I'm just oh, saying yeah. somebody yeah. watches me because I talk about money on my reviews. You do as mm-hmm. well. So it's going to be really interesting to see the difference between those that you feel are are optimistic, maybe. And I'm and I know what you're saying. Not too much, but you know, are are overly optimistic versus cautiously because yeah. ca- cautiously optimistic is really cool if you understand how to do it. Because what it does is it really I think allows you to interact with the fiction without blowing it up or dropping it down, or really adjusting day to day. I've had friends who've been like this, dude, this is the greatest game ever today. And then the next day, they're like, eh. And you're like, well, wait a minute. That was only eight hours ago. Mm -hmm. I went to sleep, and then this morning I wasn't as excited. And I'm like, well, you're not talking about the game. You're talking about you. There's Mm -hmm. those, those aren't, they're not connected. And, and I just hope people go into it, know what to expect. And goddamn, I hope they do a good job, dude. Because Mm -hmm. if they don't, I'm going to be so I was going to say, what happens, what happens then? If they succeed, it'll be a great thing. But they've technically, I I say technically, um, had success with Inquisition. I don't think that game was game of the year. I, I don't, I still don't. Um, but technically they had success. Let's say this is a drop off. Andromeda sucks. I don't think it will. But uh, let's say it's just Well, let's not... compare it. Can, can you compare it to another game then? So, because a sucks doesn't quanti- like that's. But is there another game out there that that from a big company with a lot of money still? Okay, Mafia. Jesus, perfect, perfect example. Yeah. Okay, Mafia. Okay, so if if are you saying if Andromeda is Mafia three, they're going to be in deep shit? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> they're going to be it's, pretty messed up. I oh, think. technically, <laughs> if yeah, technically is one of the things we haven't even talked about. If this thing technically has issues like a Mafia three, mm. or or just or just comes across as shallow which I don't think it will, but it's a good example of a game from a sequel that didn't do so well. Oh, dude, I don't know what they would do. I mean, I think they have enough money. They would probably get, they would probably still make two, but oh, man. That I don't was, think, people I don't won't think of Bioware. If that happens. Yeah, it's true, but I don't, I don't view Bioware. I, I could be wrong. I'm just trying to think if, I, I mean, facial animations maybe, but I've never thought of them as a, a, a buggy kind of developer um but then again that's that's coming from someone who's who's focused on bethesda game studios a lot in the past where um you know you look at them and it's like jesus christ and then you look at others and it's like none of them are as bad where um i guess that's where i struggle sometimes to identify well they brought up the bad animations so i mean you know the fa- even the director himself just recently said yeah aaron Flynn, it, he was just like yeah, yeah it'll be fixed i'm like it'll be fixed you plan so. on fixing that entire problem 
two well three I would, months you were before. bringing up tech issues and you were saying you don't know I would say that's about right like that's yeah. where you could probably expect the game because we only have two months so you'll see some improvements I don't think it'll be a Bethesda you know I love you know me man I fucking Morrowind I believe I love them all but mm-hmm. they're <laughs> when you first well, buy them, uh, <laughs> you're not quite sure what's going to happen. One of the happen. games you should probably wait a year on <laughs> to yeah. get fully patched. Yeah, if it does a Mafia Three, I, I do believe Bioware is going to be in uh, in unique waters, not bad or anything, but um, y- y- there'd be a lot of why. Uh, mm-hmm. La Noir released the same way. People saw it as Rockstar, even though it really wasn't all. It was bon- Team Bondi, but people were like, you know, and that didn't Ow. do as well as people mm-hmm. thought. And it was Ow, exactly. It was like whoa what just happened and then that company disintegrated i don't think bioware would but um i do think it would adjust their scope i do yeah in, i mean the reason i i um not only want to succeed because i like mass effect but because i know they're going to make a star wars rpg soon for sure yeah, ea owns the license and that they are assigning every one of their developers to make a star wars game they said bioware is coming soon it's got to be i mean they i imagine not like you mean uh, go soon, tour but- style Single player? I, I don't, yeah, like, I don't know. I don't know a thing uh, about it. I'm just saying I know for a fact they're working on something sure, Star Wars sure. related. It's been rumored for a while, and it makes sense because EA has DICE on one, Visceral on one, EA Motive on one. It only right. makes sense Bioware is going to be working on one. So I want them to get this right to establish confidence moving into that as well. That I know, oh my God, remember Mass Effect Andromeda? Remember all the good they did with this yeah. game? Imagine if they do this with... uh Star Wars, and especially because, I mean, sci-fi, Star Wars, sci-fi, RPG, you know, sure, it seems like a bread and butter sort of thing. Um, I, that's also why I really hope it succeeds. It's not just for the now, for the sake of the Andromeda and my love for that franchise, uh, Mass Effect, but also for the future, going sure. into other titles that I hope those successes pass on. And that's why when you said earlier, when you were like, yeah, I think... Two of the MMO directors are working on other titles. I'm like, I feel fucking bad for those titles because I hope to God not one of them Star Wars. I, re- <laughs> I really, for my sake, for my sanity, I pray not. I will lose my mind if, if finally I get a Star Wars RPG and it sucks donkey dick. I'll be so can, upset. Can you imagine if they went, you know, if they were like, even though this won't happen because they said Knights of the Republic is dead. They're not doing anything prior. Yeah. But it would be crazy if, if they did go like, KOTOR, we've decided to do it, and we were lying, and it, it turned out bad, and you were just like, how? How do you do that? Oh, it would be like man. a Final Fantasy being absolutely terrible versus just like 13, not as three. loved. You know, Lightning Returns. What, was that a real Final Fantasy, or was that one of the yeah, side? Yeah, that, that was a part of the Thirteen franchise. It was a re- it was a re- I consider it a real Final Fantasy. It's like, you know, people don't pretend 10-2 wasn't something. Um, so I'd say mm. Final Fantasy Thirteen Lightning Returns. Gotcha. Uh, that was just bad. So yeah, I mean, I I, I genuinely think though they're going to remaster Kotor one and two. I really do at some point in time. Uh, I mean, I've seen too many big names spit out that yeah, we want this done. Like we want to have this happen. Like Phil Spencer, if you get the head of fucking Xbox saying like, yeah, we're looking into it, and that EA is like, yeah, we we want to uh, consider this. Like, just fucking do it already. It's Disney like, would be foolish not to. Mm-hmm. Um, with all with all the talk that you guys got have going on of uh, Star Wars and video games, I, I've seen firsthand and I've kept up with um, the business side of reading up on Disney's progress with Star Wars. And man, they are really pushing on all fronts. They want to get what they bought this for back <laughs> yeah. as soon as possible. Yeah, and so then true. double their money. Yeah. So when it comes to Star Wars and just making quality products, Disney's all in. I think that they probably will push forward with that soon. I'd be surprised if they didn't. Yeah, I think it would be a missed opportunity of theirs. Yeah, I think it would, but I I think that with their canceling completely of their own product, which was Infinity, um, and and shut and shutting down all of their own development studios, I think that what we think is intelligent may not be exactly what someone who runs Disney may. Somebody may be in higher up who's like, hey, but they, I mean, they ejected their core. A lot of their core, a lot, you know, they ejected them. So it's like you do have to sell it to Bioware if you want them to do it because you can't use, you can't use what they had, which was their Infinity teams. I just, I don't know, like, I don't know the idea of a Star Wars RPG. Like, don't you think, Maddie, that that's killing? That's like in some way sucking a little bit of the of the Mass Effect. Um, yeah, energy they're definitely. Away. Yeah, like, that, that's what I was thinking as I was saying it. Is that sci-fi? Sci-fi. I was like, you know, there are parallels you can draw, but it's um, it, the, what for me, what really stood out is that um, 
Knights of the Old Republic is what got me into Star Wars. It wasn't even the movies or uh, the comics or oh, anything. It, right. it was the, the game itself. And that's because, um, not that I thought uh, like original Star Wars is bad. I hadn't really seen it at the time, of course. But it was just that um, it stood apart so much from the other things. And that's why um, if you set it in a timeline um, similar to a Old Republic where it was very different where you have like Vibro Blaze. It's like, I thought this was Star Wars. And, you know, at the time I didn't know the difference, but... Um, you know, you, you look at it and it's like, this is so different. Why, why are people equipping blades, not lightsabers yet? And um, it, it was just so vastly odd compared yeah. to what I had a personal and from what I've seen in commercials and stuff, my personal expectations for Star Wars. And um, you're ushering in a new era of Star Wars. It's doing amazingly well that I think, yeah, if you were to if I were Bioware and I was going to make another Star Wars RPG, I wouldn't set it during the seven to nine episode era. I'd set it try to convince disney let's set this somewhere else so you know, look, at, look at this look at the success of the even though i'm not a fan of it look at the success of the mmo the old republic uh look at the success of kotor look how many people love kotor let us do what we want in our own section of the galaxy and it'll be successful maybe yeah hopefully i've always wanted to see i'm not i'm not super huge on star wars but i've always wanted to see this this would put me in one of the seats for the movies a story about the rise, the first rise of the Jedi over the Sith that put them in power for the prequels. Mm -hmm. I want to see that story where they first fought their way to the top and had the light side on top first. I think yeah. that would be a cool story. I think um, there's a good chance we're going to see a lot more spinoffs just due to the fact that uh, Rogue One did so well and was so well received. You know, it's not like Episode 7 now where it's kind of being picked apart for uh, brief mistakes like... Um, uh, I mean, I'm imagining most people have seen episode seven by now, but um, like after Han Solo dies, that uh, I think like Chewbacca just walks by like during this uh, sad scene where um, Ray and Leia are hugging that uh, Chewbacca just did, like doesn't even acknowledge what's happening. He just kind of walks by like out of like past the screen, like eh, whatever. Yeah, my, my best friend just died. Shit happens, dude. Like um, so like people are picking apart those minuscule things now. Where uh, you don't really see that type of focus on the Rogue One expansion, where uh, I, I think you could expect to see more spinoff stories like that. At least I'd say it's safe to say. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I, 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 mm. I would love to see an, another Kotor, but I, I just, I don't, I don't. No. I, I, I don't think it'll be Kotor did. either. I, I've said that for a while. I, I don't think it'll be Kotor either. I think it will be a, a Star Wars. That's why I just say Star Wars RPG now. I so like a side story, like like. Yeah, Rogue like one. if anything, yeah, you know, a standoff or standalone, sorry, um, like a Rogue One, like in its you own section of the timeline. Dude, thirteen, thirteen. When I taught, when uh, Jesse Harlan came on my channel, and we were because mm. he's the composer, and he's like, dude, I was done with thirteen, thirteen's music, like I was done, like we were, and the discussion we had about that, that game was a long ways away. Uh, like, uh, sorry, it was, uh, it, it had been worked on for a long time. It was, it was very well off when they canceled that. And it was going to be, the rumor was it had sh shifted, but it was all about the underside non-Jedi lifestyle mm -hmm. that occurs in Star Wars that we never see. The fucking, like, bounty hunters and the yeah. undercurrent. And I'm just like, that would have been the coolest. That's why that's were what so gutted, brief so two-second uh, teaser looked like to uh, me, where you see this normal dude with a gun step outside and you let's see, hope. like... Yeah, it, 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 that's what it reminded me of, though, um, which gives me imagine, hope. Imagine, God, Maddie, imagine making your own bounty <laughs> hunter, your own bounty hunter with your yeah. own, like, very unique weapons, not the same, yeah. but, like, I love just... Visceral, so I, I hope that's oh. the case, because I think, um, though a lot of people don't like Battlefield Hardline, I did enjoy that title. I know I'm very much in the minority there. Um, Holy shit. Yeah, I'm very you much... You fucking in... liked Hardline? I wouldn't even say liked. <laughs> I just I just enjoyed it. I, I liked the cop, <laughs> Cops and Robbers theme. <laughs> He's fucking... <laughs> No way! <laughs> Why the fuck is I'm this so, so fun? I'm so blown away because Hardline was <laughs> Hardline was terrible. Hardline I like was the cops and robbers theme, dude. The, what? The I, cops and I, robbers theme in the multiplayer? Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. that was actually the gradual dude. fall of your face during that moment was oh, beautiful. Dude, it just, <laughs> I, I thought he was fucking with me the entire time. No. I'm like, because no one likes Hardline, right? And he just That's and it's like, it's like it's. 
it, they're giving like, it away right I'm, now. <laughs> that's why I was like, I'm. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've just never heard anybody like Hardline. That's just great. There's nothing wrong with liking it, by the way. I just it was no. I, I know it's. That's why I say I'm oh. like I am so in the minority there. I know no one likes Hardline, but that, I'm saying like I like Visceral. You know, I, I liked Hardline to some extent. Um, <laughs> I feel horrible about that now, but uh, I also like you Dead should. Space a lot. <laughs> That's the main reason why, though. I, I like Dead Space a lot, um, oh, gotcha. and so yeah. I, I have confidence in their sci-fi exploration and and storytelling there, um, despite three. Three, um, looking back, they got a little lazy with some stuff, but yeah, I, I like what I was trying to get at is I, li- <laughs> I like Visceral, so I, I like the idea of them making a Star Wars game, though I don't know if they'd actually... I, I can't see them doing a like create-your-own-character sort of thing oh right yeah god I, though that would be so cool if they did man imagine I, it yeah i um you think it you think they'll want to be character driven kind of thing where it's like you have it's to you're that they've never done i mean then again like i look at gorilla games you know they've made kill zone it's like no way they'll make this fucking open world robot dinosaur shit and there's horizon from that oh, same true. team yeah, so good... um you know i guess looking at uh this studio, I wouldn't imagine them to let you create your own character in a Star Wars universe, but there's a good chance they could. You know, it depends if they think the idea works. I hope they right. do. That would be fucking awesome. But um, did you like the lightsabery? Uh, I'm Vader's apprentice. Um, two oh, two games. Oh, uh, Force, Force Unleashed. Force Unleashed. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Force Unleashed. Did you guys like that? One, yes, a lot. Two, not as much. But I didn't think that was awful. Nick, did you play him? I wish I'd had the opportunity. <laughs> Gotcha. Um, okay. I was so, not in the means when those came out, but I like the idea. Yeah, and they were they were one character. I mean, you couldn't adjust him. So I guess you yeah, know. Star Killer was cool. Uh, yeah, Star Killer was pretty cool. But yeah, there's because here's the thing is that Star Wars has such an advantage off the bat because it's like it's Star Wars. You know right. what I'm saying? Like that universe just excites people, gets you to want to like it instantly. So my thoughts are that. Um, you know, if you have a set protagonist or not, I think it can work out very well for them. Would I rather a create your own character sort of thing? Absolutely. Any time of the day, I'd like to be myself over another character. Um, right. As, as fucking egotistical as that sounds, I just I like <laughs> the idea of injecting myself and putting myself in that moment because I give more fucks then at that point. I'm, I'm good enough. <laughs> Matt, yeah. Matty's like, I'm yeah. good enough. I don't yeah. need anybody. I can, I don't I can fucking handle this. Trust me. <laughs> no, no, it, it means more. That's 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 yeah, part of the entire appeal of RPGs mm-hmm. is that you're you're playing a character that is as close to injecting yourself into the experience as you can get. You feel a little bit more in the moment than you would with another character because another person you have to empathize playing us playing an avatar of yourself you're right on it yeah yeah exactly um i think it's more of a personal connection where um for example our uncharted it's like i don't really care what happens to nathan drake um don't get me wrong though there are games where like you know you have the set protagonist i still care uh it's just that i i find myself way more engaged on a different level caring way more about my decisions when i'm it, like you said it's me i'm there i'm injecting what right. i am into the game Man, we're uh, near in two hours. Does anyone have any uh, any final thoughts? Stop! I, I knew. I see you holding it back. You keep. I'm your trying not head. to laugh. Yeah. Even it's this fucking battlefield. Here's. By the way, this is. It's not that I'm laughing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have we sure. have we have face cams on. He's put his head down a total of like three I, times since I, then, I, trying not to laugh. Just like. But I'm not. <laughs> I'm not dissing on Maddie for liking. So so in I reviewed that game and. Kelly Hugh, who mm. in one moment she's against a wall and you're protecting her as people come into the house. Do you remember this, Maddie, yes. at all? Do you remember yeah. this? And in my life, I've never been as horrified and scared of a character. She looked like a mannequin that had been given voodoo power <laughs> to come alive. Like it was the worst effect I've ever seen. And she's right here. And so in my video, in my review, she like fucking goes, Nyeh! and she's like, you she's just instantly yeah. there and it's yeah. scary as hell and i actually had people who were re- re- watching the review go like that was and and so it's goofy stuff or the time when you go outside and they're like we're, we got to go from here to this building over here mm. and we're gonna we're gonna go in and we're gonna take them down and i'm like okay no problem and there's like you walk down two blocks and there's like one guy outside and <laughs> as i was reviewing it i was like oh apparently the rapture happened before we got here because there's nobody yeah. here like who no, are we no, killing? i, I should have clarified that the, the single player no the yeah. multiplayer yeah. i i that's why i like just the cops and robbers theme because they the built multiplayer was good by the way yeah, yeah. so you're you're totally right it, it, and it was just the funny moments that i remember from that yes. game and then having somebody say they liked it just got me by <laughs> <surprise>. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and I have no problem with people liking shitty games. I like, you know, I like Sims. I like Alpha Protocol. Well, Alpha bad. Protocol's pretty good. No, I, I never, about I never it. played that. Wait, what? Yeah, never Obsidian? Played no, I know. I haven't played it, though. It, it's KOTOR with guns. What do you, really? Ooh. You are, you are missing, you are missing out, even though it doesn't have the best control anymore. You are missing out if you don't at least try Obsidian okay. or uh, Alpha Protocol. Okay. First game I've ever seen that has a better split narrative than any Bioware game ever. You can split the narrative and do things. Your end will be nothing like my end. A completely Ooh. different storyline like at the that. end. I like that. Okay, I'm yeah. going to look at that. Yeah, check it out. Hmm. So, uh, hmm. any any final comments on Bioware, where they're heading with Mass Effect? No, I'm optimistic. I've, I've never picked up a Mass Effect game, really, and fully played through, but Andromeda, I am going to pick up. I, I think I'm going to enjoy my experience Ooh. with it, and I'll definitely be reporting back to you guys on what I think. Awesome. Yeah, Mass Effect's Andromeda will be the second Mass Effect I'm picking up on launch. The first one was three. I will never forget that moment because a really attractive GameStop employee conned me into buying the day one DLC because I was like <laughs> 13 and she was just she was so unbelievably attractive and using her charm on me. I was just like, oh, OK, I got to buy it. Like, sh maybe she'll go on a date with me or some shit the fuck was i thinking but regardless yeah I'm is this my first to romance option from the game <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's it yeah I, it's I'm like real life dlc baby picking up <laughs> andromeda as well on launch date what about you carrick oh yeah I'm, i mean i can't wait like it's gonna be yeah it's gonna be awesome even if it's it's gonna sound bad but even if it's bad or we have a mafia 3 it's gonna be really interesting from a developer standpoint from somebody who knows the industry it's gonna be mm -hmm. fun just to talk to you and go what happened you know yeah i can't wait it's a it's yeah, probably the biggest release this gen so far yeah yeah absolutely. i had an entire hour and a half of playing mafia 3 once where the shaders on lincoln yeah. clay half of them disappeared yep. and so for an entire hour and a half he ran around le legitimately looking like he was soaked in someone's blood if I have a moment like that playing Andromeda, well, please don't be entertained. <laughs> will be playing Battlefield multiplayer by the end of the yeah. night. We're like fucking. Well, I'll, I'll be like, man, I'm playing better. Yeah, yeah, I'm playing. I'm playing Andromeda. What are you playing? Oh, I switched to Battlefield. Or, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, you're. Anymore. Yeah, it's it's gonna be so fucking cool. Mm -hmm. I can't wait. Looking forward to it. Anyway, Nick, thank you so much for joining us, man. It was yeah, a that pleasure was awesome. having you. Great conversation, Absolutely. bro. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Yeah, any uh, plugs you want to do to your channel before we wrap this bad boy up? Uh, yeah, if you guys uh, out there are interested in uh, interesting storytelling and, you know, piecing things together, all detective-like, my channel is uh, full of that. I mentioned the Wyoming incident earlier. You guys might have been interested in uh, taking a look at that, as Garrick seemed to be. It is, it's a hell of a twisting, turning story, and it just came back. So I'll be covering that from head to toe as it develops along with a lot of other uh, internet mysteries and just odd things floating out there. Cool. I might not have had too much to say during this, as I'm not too familiar with a lot of Bioware stuff, but... Wow, uh, you, were, you were fine, I, man. Yeah, you I were fine. I'm excited yeah, for this. Yeah, no, I thought you were great. I, I, was, I was, you know, we always get afraid when bringing on guests at times that they might be, I don't want to say too quiet, but um, that they might feel like they're going to interrupt by injecting their opinion. It's like, no, just just talk. <laughs> So it's good oh, that no, you're able I don't to have, do that. I don't have any stage fright. Just whenever I had something <laughs> legitimate to say, <laughs> that was all good for it. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on, ladies and gentlemen. That was Nick, our first patron guest, as well as an awesome YouTuber. Check out all his stuff. The links will be down below along with his uh, Twitter. Same with Carrick's channel and uh, his Twitter. And yeah, so uh, thank you guys for listening this far along. And uh, we'll catch you in next week's episode. Peace out.